Radio. Now, of all the recruitment I've seen at Talk Radio over the time I've been here, the best is our political editor, Ross Kempsell. Not only is he studiously neutral, uh, supremely well-informed, he never seems to sleep. <laughs> Day and night, I've been listening to you on the radio, Ross. Thanks for joining me in the studio to provide a bit of balance. Nobody out there is in any doubt where I stand on this. Uh, but I gave up watching Brexit after the third series, so uh, I missed the grand finale. Uh, tell us, uh, for housekeeping purposes, exactly what happened today. Well, Theresa May was again for the third time defeated on her withdrawal agreement. Remember, she had two meaningful votes on the whole package. She separated the two documents, the political declaration, which governs the future relationship between the UK and the EU after the transition period, from the withdrawal agreement, which is the technical and legal that, bit. That w that's what allowed Berkow to back down and allow it to be put to the vote. Absolutely. So the government felt that they had to find a way around Speaker Berkow's ruling, and they also felt that they had to do something today. And I think there were two elements to that. First was an optical reason. You can't not do anything on the original exit date. Otherwise, you would come in for huge criticism. That was an argument that was made at Cabinet earlier this week. But also to keep the May 22nd deadline alive that the European Union gave at European Council, uh, there was a sense that you had to try to pass the withdrawal agreement today. Of course, it failed. It was rejected again by 58 votes, a margin that is lower than has previously been seen. And we now know that a total of 81 Tory rebels have rejected reversed their position since the original meaningful vote back on the 15th of January. So that's 73 days. We've seen the number of rebels more than half, but that's not enough for Theresa May. She needed the DUP. They refused to come on board. She needed Labour votes. This morning, it looked shaky. It looked as if uh, Lisa Nandy, Gareth Snell, Labour MPs who were open to the idea of the government allowing Parliament to have more control in the future negotiations would uh, back an amendment, which they put down. That amendment was not selected by the Speaker. Another thorn in the government's side from the Speaker. But Theresa May and Geoffrey Cox, the Attorney General, said from the dispatch box that they would adopt the principles of that amendment. It wasn't enough. We didn't see any significant... Only four, only four Labour. Uh, yeah. rebels. Yeah, and two abstainers, not enough. Uh, uh, I was being briefed by government sources earlier in the day that there was going to be a huge Labour rebellion on the whip. It just didn't transpire. It just didn't happen. And uh, Theresa May is in this position where even, even with uh, uh, the DUP on board, you need the number of Tory rebels plus one on Labour. So you would still be looking on these numbers at 30 or more Labour MPs having to back a deal on a meaningful vote for next week. And these were Labour MPs with strongly leave constituencies. Gareth Snell, for example, in Stoke. Stoke is Brexit central. Yeah. Exactly. So we, we know that the number of Tory rebels, the hardcore, and this is both split across Remainers and Brexiters, is 34 now. So that is the number of Tories who voted against this today. So you would need more than 34 uh, if you brought the DUP uh, round on Labour votes. And the, the theory was always that this would happen this week because the no deal deadline would have been today. And Labour MPs who were cautious about no deal would have come round to back the government's position. But of course, the no deal deadline has been moved by the extension of Article 50. We're now talking about the 12th of April, and that's where we've defaulted to again this evening, to a 12th of April uh, uh, situation. Now, Theresa May suggested when she responded to the result that she may well try to negotiate that with the European Union to negotiate some more time. I think that there are, broadly speaking, there are four or three strategies. The first next week for the government is to just simply try the meaningful vote again to try to reduce the numbers further. The second would be to bring the withdrawal agreement bill, which is the legislation which enacts uh, the Brexit deal, and to try to pass a second reading on that of the withdrawal agreement and use that as an excuse to say that we can leave on May the 22nd. And the third would be some kind of runoff, and I think this is more likely, between Theresa May's deal and whatever option becomes uh, apparent from the indicative votes process, which starts again on Monday. And that looks like a permanent customs union, George. Now, uh, I, I don't at all uh, want to make too much of the analogy, but standing sentinel outside the public entrance to the House of Commons is a statue of Oliver Cromwell. Yep. Uh, he famously dismissed the long parliament in the for all the good that you are doing in the name of God, man, go, because that parliament had become uh, a sink of uh, inaction, uh, inertia and corruption. Uh, 
there's a lot of people in Britain thinking that about today's parliament. Um, was that, were you conscious when you were down there, not just today, but recently, that, uh, that the members of parliament know just how much is riding on all of this? Yes, I, I do think MPs have a very great sense of duty. And I think one of the big mistakes that Theresa May has made in the past few weeks, certainly uh, to parliamentary Conservative Party members who I speak to, was that speech outside Downing Street where she turned around and pointed the finger at MPs. It looked like a fit of peak, really. It looked like a frustration. Uh, understandable, perhaps, and maybe the polling suggested that the public were annoyed with parliamentarians for, in Theresa May's view, holding up the process, but it did her no favours with Tory MPs and especially with Labour MPs, it actually alienated some Labour MPs, I understand, who were on the cusp of backing the deal, that speech alone. So it seemed quite badly misjudged, simply to turn around and say, actually, it's your fault, because people generally don't buy that, because Theresa May is in government. She has the executive authority. She has the ability to run things in the House of Commons, despite the Speaker. There are ways around this. And the government has consistently failed uh, three times now to get this through the, through the House of Commons. Not very many people People are sympathetic to forgive that when Theresa May has had two years to sell this to, to her own MPs, let alone to other MPs and the public. Now, finally, and I'm grateful for your time after a long and busy day, uh, I noticed that in your list of options you did not include either a change of prime minister or a general election. Uh, are either or both of these in play, do you think? Yeah, so a change of prime minister is definitely in play. Theresa May committed already, we know, not to stand at the next general election. But if you look at her words to the 22 and they were echoed today publicly from the dispatch box, the strong suggestion is that she would stand down if the withdrawal agreement were passed and you would have a Tory leadership election after May the 22nd if that exit date were kept alive. There's a question mark over that now because we've gone back to April the 12th. But if there was some... It now way depends to, on the EU to agree to that. It now depends on the EU to agree to that. But if there was some, if there was some possibility of keeping that alive, Theresa May's pledge to go would presumably still be in play. Now you would have a Tory leadership contest you know how Tory leadership contest works you have the parliamentary phase that whittles down to two candidates who go to about 100,000 Tory members could take between four weeks six weeks eight weeks or maybe slightly longer to whittle down so you could have a new PM in June July that would be a new PM who would take forward the future relationship negotiations which very suddenly have become a key issue of concern for MPs general election not impossible, but difficult because of the Fitzturn Parliament Act. So Theresa May needs to get votes in Parliament to have a general election. The Tories don't want a general election. Tory backbenchers don't want one. They certainly don't want one with Theresa May leading them into it. They are wounded by the experience of the snap election in 2017, where many of them lost their majorities considerably. They had a dire experience in that campaign. Very cautious of her doing that again. Not sure that it suits Labour either, frankly, because there is an argument today that Labour has blocked uh, the withdrawal agreement that would be thrown at Labour relentlessly by the Conservatives, whether it was true or not. The DUP, of course, don't want one because they will lose their position in government. Maybe the, the TIG, the independent group, want one to flex their muscles, but they have no infrastructure. They have no general election infrastructure. So I don't see how the votes fall in Parliament for an early general election. However... Should there be a vote of no confidence again in Parliament and should there be a situation where a long extension is threatened to Brexit, you could have Tory rebels on the vote of no confidence issue voting with Labour against Theresa May and bringing the government down in that fashion. But I continue to believe that the most likely way the government will fall would be a simple process of attrition where Theresa May runs out of ministers to appoint. She's down to about 20 MPs in the Conservative Party who she can plausibly ask to be ministers. She's burned through so many. There will be a position where uh, there could be a cabinet walkout. Uh, at some point, Brexit or Remainer cabinet ministers are going to uh, balk at whatever the future plan is. And at that point, you have a position where the Conservative Party, it's not implausible, could fall apart in office. That is what the whole strategy has been about avoiding. But we are still not out of the woods on that. And if that happens, you've got a general election. I said right at the beginning, this was supposed to be Brexit day as well as the anniversary of my historic by-election victory in Bradford West in 2012, which means it's the eve of my wedding anniversary, so I better stop off at a petrol station on the way home. 
and see if there's a box of chocolates still on the shelves. It was supposed to be Brexit Day, but it became instead Groundhog Day. Now, I have a very strong feeling that something profoundly changed in British politics today and that the two main parties, both of whom are culpable for the failure of Britain to Brexit as scheduled and as promised, quite a crucial point that, both of the main parties that are responsible for this will pay a heavy price at the ballot box for it. And that was reflected in Ross Kempsell's remarkable review of all the reasons why there won't be a general election, even though number 10 were threatening one in the run-up to this vote. The Tories don't want one. Labour doesn't want one. The Independent Group doesn't want one. Whatever they say, the SNP doesn't want one. The DUP doesn't want one because... They have no guarantee at all that they'll still be in pole position, giving a confidence and supply agreement to a Tory government afterwards. No confidence, not much supply, but plenty moolah crossing the Irish Sea from your pocket to the DUPs. So we have a situation where millions of people amongst the general public, thousands of whom, if not tens of thousands of whom, are mustering in Parliament Square now behind the banner of Mr Farage. And millions are furiously angry with them, but, or maybe because of that, the main parties, whatever they say, don't want a general election. Because if there was a general election, Labour would say to the Tories, it was you that couldn't get it through. And the Tories, flying the flag and bedecked in khaki, would say we tried to deliver Brexit, but Labour blocked it. And of course, that is the truth, the uncomfortable truth. It's true that they could not have blocked it, but for the Tory rebels, it's true that they could not have blocked it, but for the DUP. But the majority of MPs who voted to block Brexit today were Labour MPs. And the majority of the talking heads of the FBPE soft shoe shufflers are Labour personalities. Tony Blair, Alastair Campbell, Will Straw, all the creatures from the deep of the Blair era. Labour is hoist on this petard. I'm sorry, Labour friends of mine listening to this. I know that it will be painful for you to hear it, but don't forget I've been warning you of this for the last three years. I'm not going to repeat, not least because of the hour, I'm not going to repeat everything I said last week in my monologue, but I commend it to the House. If you haven't yet listened to it, it's available on YouTube. Belatedly, but available on YouTube. I commend it to you. I'm not going to repeat it, but I am going to say this unequivocally, that not since the long Parliament cleared out by Oliver Cromwell has there been a parliament, an Augean stable, like the current House of Commons, been held in such utter contempt by so many British people. Not just over Brexit, but over many, many things. I was reflecting today, you may have seen it on my Twitter feed, on the land of the giants that I entered half, literally half, a lifetime ago. Tories, Labour and others. Even the DUP was represented by a giant figure, the Reverend Ian Paisley, who cannot be compared, I assure you, to his Lilliputian son, Ian Paisley Jr. Mr Ben, Mr Foote, 
all these great figures on the labour benches. Mrs Thatcher, Mr Heseltine, a whole parade of big people. On the Conservative side, this is a Parliament now, not just held in contempt by millions of people, but worthy of the contempt of millions of people. Absolutely worthy of that contempt, and yet we can't get rid of them because they won't call an election and they made a fixed-term Parliament Act which protects them. The MPs have to vote like turkeys for an early Christmas, and turkeys don't tend to do that. So where does that leave us? It leaves us betrayed, quivering with rage and anger, apparently impotent, but wait, but wait. Every cloud, they say, has a silver lining, and one of the silver linings of what happened today, or failed to happen today, is that Britain will now have to fight the European Parliament elections on the 23rd of May. And I'm going to predict to you, remember you heard it here, that the two main parties whose members of the European Parliament are overwhelmingly creatures of the Brussels Deep, Stockholm Syndrome, captives, institutionalised prisoners, old lags, will be decimated, decimated in the elections on the 23rd of May. Labour and Conservative will pay a very high price at the ballot box on the 23rd of May, I predict. And although it's not yet the electoral period, I will be one of those who will contest in the northwest of England for a parliamentary seat in Europe. And I tell you something, Donald Tusk and Herr Juncker will have to develop slightly larger ears in order to listen to me in the House of Commons in the House of the European Parliament, I should say. Now, you've been wondering what happened to Tamar, yeah? Tamar Afsahani, you wondered what had happened to him. I've sent him down, foreign-looking, with a funny tinge as he is, to the Tommy Robinson gathering down in Westminster. And we'll hear from him right after this. Tama, stay safe, because you're a funny tinge and all that. Hello there, George. Uh, I, I am here down the streets. As you can hear, it's pandemonium. On the day Putin was supposed to leave the European Union, people that Lee wanted to leave and people that wanted to remain seemed to find themselves in this quagmire in which nothing has been resolved. May, almost dictatorial in her ways of the exit deal has left a huge number of people completely and utterly shattered in confidence. The sounds that we hear from here outside Downing Street, outside of 10, are, you failed us, this is not a democracy, and we can go on like this. Unfortunately, there is a core of people here that are intent on marching and continuing to march to make their voices heard. It's the row of police outside of number 10 is three man deep, now becoming four. There is much, much anger than there has been before. It's important to note that most of these people that have marched down the street have come directly on the back of a Tommy Robinson. We might have to come back to you, uh, intriguingly. That was a cliffhanger. Uh, um, because I'm joined now by His Eminence. If he had a ring, I'd kiss it. Professor Sir John Curtis, the Prince of Sophologists, Professor of Politics at the University of Strathclyde and Senior Research Fellow at the National Centre for Social Research. 
uh, Professor Sir John, thanks for joining us no, all, George. in nice the to hear. studio. Uh, I did not expect anything like the numbers that Mr. Farage has gathered in Parliament Square, and I expected the Tommy Robinson quotient to be very much larger than it is as a proportion. I've been down there. I've seen it. Right. Uh, the anger is palpable. Mm -hmm. We just heard it from our reporter on the streets. I've been developing from the start of the show this Oliver Cromwell uh, metaphor uh, when he dismissed the long parliament for all the good that you have been doing in the name of God, man, go. Uh, there's something in the air of that, isn't there? Uh, yes, um, uh, in much the same way as the um, People's Vote campaign march of last Saturday also demonstrate the strength of feeling on the other side. One of the things that we know from the kind of survey research that I do is that around 40% of people say that they are either a very strong Remainer or a very strong Lever. Um, and that contrasts, if you ask exactly the same question about whether or not people, how people feel about political parties, only around 10% of us feel either very strong Conservative, Labour or whatever. Really? Um, we are now much, much more engaged and much more attached to one or other sides of the Brexit debate than we are to any of the political parties. The, the last time that we had attachment to political parties on the scale and the intensity that we're now seeing towards Brexit is back in the 1960s. So there is no doubt there's very strong feeling on both sides. It's also fair to say that as a result of that, we are in truth polarised between two points of view. So you're absolutely right to suggest that the people who are out there who are complaining about the fact that we are not leaving at 11 o'clock tonight do represent a substantial body of people. Around a half of those people who voted to leave say that leaving without a deal is their first preference and probably around two-thirds of Leave voters would be willing to contemplate the possibility. That said, however, just bear in mind that two-thirds of 50% is only about a third of the whole electorate. But it's still one of the two most popular options for what we should be doing. On the other side of the fence, however, the single most popular option amongst those who voted to remain, and it seems to be backed by around two-thirds of them, is to have another referendum in which they are hoping we would come to a different decision. And that, of course, is the other end of the spectrum that was expressed on the streets last weekend. But again, two-thirds of 50% is only around a third. And the truth is that there is no majority for any of the courses of action that we uh, possibly have before us because uh, the, 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 we're, we're, the two most popular things are the two things that we might want to call the extreme and there isn't much support for the compromises in the middle, but in the end, public opinion is fractured. And although I heard you very eloquently um, uh, criticise the House of Commons and its inability to make a decision and the way in which, above all, you feel that it's, it, it's uh, tried to stymie Brexit. But the honest truth is the House of Commons is actually doing rather a good job of representing the state of public opinion. The truth is, as a public, we are uh, seriously divided, we are fractured, and it's not obvious that there is a majority amongst any of us or anything. I mean, Sky Data did, uh, did a poll a couple of days ago in which they put all the various options... Second referendum just managed to go ahead. Everything else voted down, much like the House of Commons. I take that point. Uh, my rejoinder would be that there was a referendum that the people were told would be final, and that has not been implemented. Well, the problem is, yeah, and this is a crucial point to understand, in pr promising the referendum and saying it would be final, the truth was that what was being ignored was that whether and how we left the European Union was not entirely within the gift of the UK state to engineer. There were a set of rules and procedures laid down in the European Union treaties that we have had to follow. So, for example, although, yes, we had the right to say we wanted to leave the European Union, we were legally obliged to give two years' notice. And that's but one example of how, in contrast, for example, remember the referendum on the alternative vote for the House of Commons? With that... 
the state could deliver. If we had voted in favour of changing the electoral system in the House of Commons, it would have happened. Indeed, it was already in the legislation. It just needed the referendum to say yay or nay. But this was different. This was a referendum in which delivery and implementation did not simply lie within the hands of the state and therefore, to that extent at least, was always at risk of being problematic in much the same way, of course, was true of the Scottish independence referendum. As the SNP discovered during that campaign, they could not necessarily guarantee that the form of independence that they were seeking would necessarily be achieved because it would rely on the cooperation of the UK government. Well, uh, it's a slight segue, but uh, one lesson uh, for... Scottish voters and Scottish nationalists is that they have demonstrated that a referendum is not final and that a deal yes. has to be reached and that deal might have to go back for a confirmatory referendum, etc., etc. Indeed, indeed. Oh, there are all sorts, there, there are all sorts of um, cross currents here, of course. What's also true is that the fact that Theresa May has now repeatedly, but repeatedly, but repeatedly put the same deal to the House of Commons means that attacks on the SNP as being in favour of neverendum are never going to have quite the same force from the Conservative Party as they hitherto have done. Coming back to the UK situation, Parliament, the referendum itself, um, we both know that whilst uh, global numbers are, of course, crucial in a referendum, global numbers are meaningless in parliamentary constituencies because what counts there is that you win your own constituency uh, even by a single vote yep. and you take all. Yep. You uh, know better than me uh, that the majority of Labour constituent labor held constituencies the majority of tory held constituencies the majority of regions and so on voted uh, leave uh -huh. what's your best estimate of what the impact on individual constituency contests this will be i give you one example uh, gareth snell in stoke central yeah stoke you could say brexit central he won a by-election on a very low turnout with a very low vote. I wished I'd stood in it, actually, because he only <laughs> got 8,000 votes and he won. Uh, 8,000 votes winning a parliamentary seat. In Brexit Central, his opponent, opponents at the next general election are going to say, you knew what we voted for, you knew what we wanted, and yet you voted to stop Brexit. Yeah, but you're, all over the but country, you're, you're making in a major assumption here, George, which is that although it is true that all of the voters in many of the constituencies represented by Labour MPs in the north of England and the Midlands, across the electorate as a whole, there was a majority in favour of leave, although not very often a very large majority. Well, the Midlands, that, that, 10 out of 10 in yeah, the Midlands. Yeah, sure, sure. But it's not, it does not follow from that that a majority of Labour voters voted no, to leave, no. right? And indeed, we know from research, and I and others have done, that in most of constituencies in the north of England and the Midland, with, with, represented by Labour MPs, a majority of Labour voters voted to remain. And, and let me give you... I mean, I think... I, 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 the honest truth is, I think the risk to the Labour Party... The risk the Labour Party has been running for the last two years, and it is a risk where there are now signs in the opinion polls that it, that, that it may be beginning to be realised. Have to remember, around 70% of the people that voted Labour in 2017 voted Remain. And that the Labour vote became more pro-Remain in 2017 than it had been at the time of the EU referendum. So although it's undoubtedly true that ideally what Labour Party wants to do and what it's been trying to do for the last two years is to triangulate in such a way that it keeps both parts of its coalition together, at the end of the day, the crude arithmetic is that actually there are that, that, that of the two groups it is at risk of losing, the Remain group is the larger, and that is true outside of London as those within uh, it, albeit the Labour vote outside of London is more pro-leave than inside. Well, that's true, Professor, of course. Uh, I, I hesitate to interrupt you, uh, but if you, if the 30%, let's take yeah, your yeah. figure, yeah. If, if the 70% remain with you, but the 30% desert you, 
You've lost your seat. Uh, correct, but if you lose the thir- if you keep the thirty percent and lose the seventy percent, you're certainly well and truly a busted flush. So the point is, when forced to choose, right? As Harold Wilson said, if you can't ride two horses at once, I, I, you you shouldn't exactly. be in the circus. And, and, and bear in mind, one of the things perhaps little noticed, but has happened since the deal was unveiled in mid-November. It's a sense in which you're right, but for slightly different reasons. Both Conservative and Labour have lost ground since mid-November. So whereas you know, um, um, in the first, last of, uh, first half of last autumn, both were still running at around the 40% mark, not that sh- far short of what they got in the general election. Both of them are now running at about seven points below where they were in the 2017 election. They have both lost ground during the course of this Brexit process. Now, on the Conservative side, the risk of failing to deliver Brexit is clear. And that is that those people who switch from UKIP to the Conservatives at the beginning of the 2017 election campaign will go back towards UKIP. And you can already see that happening in the opinion polls. Uh, between them, Nigel Farage and UKIP are running at 7 8% in the opinion polls, and it's coming off the Conservative leave vote very heavily. But equally on the other side, it's now looking as though... Re- remember, and this is, you know, you might find this slightly difficult, but remember that what Jeremy Corbyn achieved in the 2017 election was to secure the kind of electorate that Tony Blair would have died for. That is, it was not particularly left-wing, but it was definitely socially liberal. He was winning over, disproportionately, voters who were pro-Remain. He was winning over young people. He was winning over university graduates. This was the new shape of the Labour Party that Jeremy was calling winning over, the very kinds of voters that Tony Blair was wanting to, to, to obtain. So, therefore, there is a risk that the Labour Party will lose that uh, section of, the, of its support if they become disenchanted. Now, at the moment, there is no one single party that is eroding Labour's strength amongst Remainers. But the truth is the Greens are much higher now in the polls than they were in the election. Um, the Liberal Democrats are at least still uh, h- holding water. We do have the independent group, which is again appealing to a very similar set of voters um, as is the uh, uh, Liberal Democrats. And the SNP north of the border are certainly hanging on at least to what they've got. And therefore against that backdrop, the Labour vote is just, it's fragmenting. Mm-hmm. in a variety of yeah, different yeah. directions. Yeah. But the problem for Labour, at the end of the day, you know, I don't think Labour, the biggest risk to Labour is not being criticised for failing to deliver Brexit. That is the risk the Tories run. And the Tories are, I think, making a bit of a mistake in assuming that they can effectively attack Labour by criticising Labour for failing to deliver what the Tories themselves should be trying to deliver. Sure, right? that's, sure. a, that's an argument that will appeal to, 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 the, to the Tories' own voters, but it won't appeal on the Labour side of the fence with anything like the force that the Tories imagine. Uh, I take that point, absolutely. Uh, Labour's problem, though, is that it is now under attack from both sides, from the, the soft shoe shufflers that were on the streets last weekend. They sure, denounced exactly. Labour, they denounced Corbyn for not being yeah. uh, anti-Brexit yeah. enough. And the Brexit people denounce Corbyn for Labour's role in uh, what's happened subsequently. Uh, Professor, will you stay with us for a moment? Yeah, of course. I need to take a break for some capitalist messages. <laughs> I'm glad to say uh, Professor Sir John Curtis, the prince of all sophologists, has remained with us. And he's going to take some calls with me. And that is definitely going the extra mile. And I'm grateful to him for that. But Tamar... Asfahani, who drew the short straw and got sent down to Westminster, is back on the line. Tamar, what's happening? Well, the crowds are subsiding slowly, but there are still quite a lot of protesters here um, protesting the fact that democracy is dead. Uh, So much so that I've got Kingsley Hamilton with me here. Kingsley, uh, you're holding something quite interesting. Can you explain to the listener what it is that you've got there? Okay, so this is a cardboard coffin. Uh, I can't take the credit for it. Somebody else made it, and uh, uh, they actually abandoned it, but I've picked up the cause. Democracy is dead because since uh, the Magna Carta was made, uh, democracy was a big thing in this country, and the vote meant something. Today, the 29th of March 2019, it's dead because our vote has been cast aside because the MPs decide they know better. So democracy is dead as far as you're concerned. Do you, I mean, I'm not going to ask you which way you voted because I think at this stage it doesn't really matter, does it? Absolutely. I was just going to say it doesn't actually matter which way people voted. The fact is um, 
the MPs are supposed to represent the people. They're not supposed to um, do their own thing, so to speak. Yes, they uh, guide us as much as they can, but when we're given a clear vote, this is an in or an out vote, uh, and it was made absolutely clear that if we wanted the benefits of the EU, we needed to vote to remain in the EU. Now, regardless of the way people voted, the public, the 17.4 million people that voted, that was the majority. It may be a slim majority, but it was a majority, and that's how democracy works. They voted to leave. And because they voted to leave, that should have been enacted, acted on. It wasn't. And here we are today trying to... So people people are very unhappy right now, Absolutely. Kingsley. Um, what, what do you think is the next step? I mean, what before we get on to that, what's the vibe been like here today? Everybody has been really positive today. There's been some really um, very patriotic chanting, cheering. Um, we've had some quite good speakers. Um, so, George, something for you to think about there. As an MP, the question is, who is your responsibility to? No, is it to your, the people no, I, I, or is I'm it to the Crown? I'm not with Kingsley on that. And you might tell him that it was a long time after Magna Carta that we got the right to vote. Uh, but, uh, no, uh, I, 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 if you want a system where... MPs are delegates. Uh, I can't go with you uh, on that. If if all of my constituents had been in favour of the Iraq war, I'd still have voted against it. Uh, and uh, it would be their right to throw me out when they, they got the chance. So I'm not with Kingsley uh, on that. Thanks, Tamar. And there was no foul language, which I was worried or indeed warned that there might be. Uh, let's take a caller, William in Sheffield. Go ahead, William. Hi, George. Hi there. Um, First time caller. Very welcome. Oh, cheers. Um, so um, I heard you mention something earlier about that, like they wouldn't be able to get um, an election through. But um, I think that whatever happens, they're definitely going to there's definitely going to be an election really, really soon. Because yeah, it is true uh, that they've got to vote for it. But uh, I think the professor's with you on this. Let me throw to him, professor. Yeah, there are two there are two ways formally under which an election ha can happen under the Fixed Terms Parliaments Act. Uh, one is that two-thirds of MPs agree that there should be one. And in a sense, the Act's been written on the assumption that if indeed a Parliament reaches a point whereby it seems impossible to make cr crucial decisions, that MPs on both sides of the House will recognise that fact and will vote to dissolve themselves. Now, as whether or not that assumption is valid or not, it's debatable. The other way, of course, however, in which an election can be precipitated is simply if the vote loses a formal... Government loses a formal vote of no confidence. That doesn't require two-thirds of MPs. It just requires more MPs to vote, to, to say they don't have confidence in the government, and that then, in a subsequent period of 14 days, no new government is formed. And I think, you know, one of the things that we've all been wondering is, well, I think certainly one of the reasons why this government could not pursue a policy of no deal is that if it were to try to do so, there would be enough Conservative MPs who would have voted against, have voted against it in a vote of no confidence to bring the government down. And the question we are asking ourselves is if indeed this government, by this time next week, has found itself writing a letter to the European Union saying, oh, by the way, we need yet another extension. It will be a government that is pursuing essentially opposition policy and that, you know, one risk the government will face in those circumstances is that some Brexiteer Tory MPs may no longer be willing to express confidence in the government. Or alternatively, here again, which, you know, Ross Cumps, your, your political editor, pointed out earlier, you know, but, uh, Theresa May is beginning to be at risk of running out of ministers. And let us say, for the purpose of argument, the more Brexiteer inclined ministers inside the current government, the, the half dozen of them, if they were all collectively to resign, I think there would be a widespread acceptance that probably then this government would have hit the, re the end of the road. It wouldn't be possible simply to replace them. And that through either one mechanism, mechanism or another, we would end up going towards a general election. But, I mean, it's certainly the case... The, the room, the, the political room that this uh, government has is becoming very, very limited. And that was always going to be the case. You know, if you want to understand why Theresa May, even this evening, is still tenaciously trying to hang on to a deal. It's not just that she is stubborn or resolute, depending on which you prefer. It is that she is perfectly well aware that that seems to be the only vehicle that if passed could probably be uh, ensure that her party stays together. Once she is no longer got that comfort bucket, her, her government as well as herself are going to be at risk.
William, thanks for that first time call. Sorry it was a short one. Professor Sir John Curtis, the Prince of Cephologist, thanks for giving us so much of your time on a Friday night. There's two more hours of this to come. Stay tuned. Now, Peter Oborn, the great man of English letters, commentator at the Daily Mail and author and broadcaster, joins me now. Peter, you won't mind if I say you kind of have a soft spot for the Conservatives. Uh, how does the Conservative Party look to you this evening? <laughs> I would say it's in a poor shape. It will, it will probably delight you to hear. I've got news which will gladden your heart, George. Uh, we have um, an impending leadership contest, a, uh, a very weak uh, and bemused uh, prime minister, um, and about a dozen hungry wolves who want her job. Yes, I, I am pleased about all of that. That's accurate, too. Uh, but she hasn't gone yet, uh, Peter. She said she'd go if her deal got passed, and it didn't. Yeah, somebody said to me yesterday night, he said, the, the fish is on the deck, but it's still flapping. That was the analogy. They <laughs> on, a, on a fishmonger's table. It, I mean, is someone going to... Uh, I don't want to use a violent metaphor necessarily, but someone going to put the fish out of its misery? Well, it is a very nice uh, question. I mean, so she's still, there is still a political intelligence and a presence of some sort at work. Uh, they, um, she, her deal has been defeated now for the third time, and there is, um, you will, I'm sure, have seen this too, the talk, which I don't understand, that there's going to be a runoff. Having been defeated three times, her deal now gets into the cup final <laughs> against the winner of the, uh, you know, the, the whatever series of votes happen on Monday, these uh -huh. so-called indicative votes. And it is thought that the customs union idea um, will win, and then you'll have the kind of much softer Brexit up against Mrs May's uh, withdrawal deal in a runoff in Parliament. That is what is being talked about. Now, what it seems feels to me that there are all kinds of problems with that idea, but I don't know. Why would the Speaker agree to take that motion when he uh, really, uh, in a Napoleonic gesture, uh, almost robbed the Prime Minister of her uh, opportunity to put it back today for a third time? Why would he allow a fourth? Yeah, that's right. That's what I mean by that being tight. Well, that's one of the uh, issues. Also, I've never really heard of a, a runoff vote. And on an issue as grave and momentous... Yeah, it's, it's rather X one. factor, Peter, for traditionalists like you and me. Yes, I mean, I, I just suspect it may be illegal. Um, but we... And I, and I agree with you. Why would the Speaker... Um, agree to it. But anyway, I'm just reporting to yes, you. Yes, no, I'm grateful uh, to you. Let's work on the assumption that, uh, that, that you know, even, uh, even uh, I can't remember now what the comedy character was that got one arm chopped off, then the other arm chopped yeah. off, and then the first yeah. leg and then the second leg, and he kept on fighting. It's the Holy Grail, Monty Python, that's right. Now, I mean, even in the end, such a, a hero has to eventually fall. So let's assume she falls. Are we talking days, weeks, months? Um, let's say she falls next week. Uh, the Tories then need to somehow get the EU to agree to uh, put everything on hold till the Tories get a new leader. Well, or there's a general election or there's... Um a referendum or something. I mean, it's uh, it, we are the the Europe now has us can do what it likes really with Britain. It can just say get, tell us to get lost and leave on the twelfth of April, which is what twelfth. Uh, yes, twelfth of April. Yeah, time. yeah. I mean, that's, that's still the default position, Peter. That is what you know. You can just say, look, um, we've had enough of you. Thanks a lot. Uh, good night. And goodbye, and we'd leave on a cliff edge, no real Brexit. Uh, more likely, they will say, "Here's another, um, here's another uh, extension in order to push through whatever version of Brexit that you want, whether it's uh, Mrs. May's sort of 
staggering uh, withdrawal deal, which is still just about alive. As I say, it's, 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 it's floundering around on the deck, but it's still got some life in it. Or the the um, or perhaps this customs union idea, which has been promoted within the Labour Party. Um, uh, all of these possibilities I- exist. Um, I-, I would have thought that there is every chance that if the customs union idea wins, then you're going to get some kind of um, split in the Conservative. Yeah, party. I was just going to ask you that. Now you're a scholar, a far greater scholar than I, but. The Corn Law uh, would be the last time the Conservatives uh, split, wouldn't it? That that looks to me uh, quite likely now. I think it's maybe it's been happening. It's a culmination of a process which date you can date back to Maggie Thatcher's famous Bruges Group speech in 1989, I think it was, and that set up the, the rift in the Conservative Party over Europe. And maybe that that will be be the moment when it formally ruptures, uh, which it hasn't done. There, there have effectively been two Conservative parties for the last uh, few months. That the so-called European Research Group, is, uh, the ERG, have been running a, a separate party within a party, a bit like uh, Tom Watson's group within Labour, yeah. who's a top party within a party. So. Uh, but what we haven't got is a formal break, and uh, whether that would happen, I think it might well. Um, and so, when you're talking about general elections uh, around the corner, uh, you know, it's not clear how the Conservative Party or Labour, for that matter, can fight one coherent general election campaign. Uh, we have, uh, we have, ent- we are in the middle of a very muddling time, George. Yes, unprecedented. Uh, let's, uh, again, still speculating. She goes, the Tories have a leadership election campaign. Mm-hmm. Who are the runners and riders? It's a common place that if Boris Johnson gets onto the ballot paper, he'll win it. But the danger for him is not getting on the ballot paper. Well, I've been reflecting uh, on this, and... Uh, you know, I, I, I was um, I'm writing about this in the Daily Mail tomorrow, about five years ago. I, I, it's not a man I know well, but I, uh, or hardly at all, actually. I, in fact, I've never, but I got a message. I would, I'd like to go and talk to Mr. John Major, the uh, Prime Minister in the 1990s. Mm. Uh, and, of course, I went to see him, and he said, you know, a lot of very bad people have started to, capture the Conservative Party. You need, we need to keep it uh, a sensible party from middle-of-the-road uh, broad church of the Nate kind, which, you know, Harold Macmillan or uh, Stanley Baldwin or Disraeli or, for that matter, John Major felt that they were in charge of. Uh, and I didn't, I, looked, I didn't fully understand what he was saying, partly because I thought he was himself tormented by his own experience of the Tory right wing. But I have, you can see what he, I know the more I thought about that conversation, the more wise I think Mr. Major was. I mean, it's not just the development of this party within a party over Europe. You, you look at this Islamophobia problem, which the Conservatives now have, very dark problem about Islam, which is afflicting the party. Um, and you can, you know, that you can see that something has, that, that, basically cheerful middle-of-the-road party is changing into something a little bit different. And I think that is what this election is about. So, And you've seen the candidates so far. They tended to gravitate towards the right. Um, and where is the where is the Harold Macmillan in all of this? Where is the Stanley Baldwin? Very, very good questions. Look forward to your column tomorrow in the Daily Mail, Peter. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Peter Oborn, commentator at the Daily Mail. Shall I uh, take a break? Well over a million uh, said you should go, but the members of Parliament, overwhelmingly hostile to that idea, have finally, well perhaps not finally, but almost finally, scuppered Brexit and people are angry about it. Though, by the law of averages, that must mean there are millions of people who are happy about it. If you're one of those on either side, give me a call, 0344 499 1000. Ricky in Glasgow has. He's up next. Ricky, welcome to the show. Thanks, George. Thank you. 
Nice to hear um, from you. Go ahead. Thank you. No, I just the comments you made about Cromwell's comments on the Parliament of the time. Yeah. I think I think we must question it. Perhaps it's very accurate in this day and age. The same comments, but perhaps in this day and age, where everybody's got a vote, perhaps the Commons is just reflecting the incompetence or the indecisions of the community at large. No, I think so. I don't, Ricky. I'll tell you why. Um, both the main parties stood for the general election in 2017 on a manifesto, both of them, which yes. explicitly stated that they would respect yes. the result of the referendum and implement it. And therefore, in my view, well. both of them are guilty of duplicity and deception over the 80% of the British people who voted for them. Well, I was wanting to have a wee argument with you, but I can't. I have to agree with you. It's nothing, there's no dispute what you've just said. I think it's uh, disgraceful, actually. Yeah, but you see, much, if, it was just, if it was just the referendum result, you could argue the toss. But if it's well, a referendum in 2016 and then a general election in 2017 and the people yeah. elected to the parliament in 2017 then betray their promise to the electorate, yes. I can't accept oh, yes, that. Exactly That's why I said, Ricky, agenda, a couple of weeks sir. ago, if you were listening, I said... This is no longer about Brexit. No, it was last week. This is no longer about Brexit. This is about democracy. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, the only thing is, with the referendum, it uh, updated the system that we're all familiar with. First past the post, and the levers were first past the post, and that's the system we use here. Yeah. Uh, we should now be out of Europe. Everything else is shameful, I think. I'm definitely just arguing with you, but I'll find something somewhere along the line. Ah, oh, well, well, maybe on the football or something, but we'll uh, we'll agree to agree <laughs> so, uh, on uh, this no, one. It's interesting you made that comment about Cromwell. It crossed my mind. Uh, this whole thing seems shameful. Just, I think you know, so. I, I, you know, I, I described it earlier as a Lilliputian parliament. It's a parliament of small people. Uh, yes, there are yes. very, very few parliamentarians that would be recognised if they walked out on the street uh, from yes. Westminster. Yeah. Uh, you, I always make the point, Ricky, I don't know what age you are, but uh, ha, ha, when Harold Wilson was the Prime Minister, there was yes. at least 10 Prime Ministers in waiting, 10, sitting in his cabinet, and most of them were trying to become the Prime Minister. But they were yes. giant household names, big figures, even in yeah, an era with no yeah, social media, even in an era That's with le true, much yeah. less TV. They were yeah. they were demonstrably big beasts. Yes. And we just so don't just have saying, that anymore. Yeah. They're just minnows we've got. We'd appear now. We've got minnows. There's no, no matter what side you're on, we don't seem to have... You know, there are two or three come through in their honesty. But overall, I can't argue with you. Um, I think it's shame, maybe, and sadness we've got here that uh, that's what we voted in. But we voted them in, George. That was well, that's decision. it. That's it. As I always say, Ricky, if you vote in donkeys, don't expect them <laughs> to do anything other than hee-haw. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ricky, for that nice call. Let's hear from Nicola in Swindon. Go ahead, Nicola. Good evening to you, George. Good evening. Uh, we're in a bit of a mess with Brexit. Yes. Uh, to be honest, to I mean, say I, the voted, least. I voted to come out and there was a couple of reasons. One of it was I wanted our own MPs, our own parliament, to take responsibility to, to make the laws and to be in charge of this country and to make decisions. And uh, I think I was a bit deluded, really, because they, they haven't even been out to be able to sort of agree on a way out. And I feel, a, I feel a bit disappointed, really, to be totally honest. I actually thought we had the sort of... The, the wherewithal in Parliament for actually people to sort of make a decision and do something. But uh, I don't know, perhaps we've got the, the wrong people there. As you say, we don't have the big names there anymore, do we? The, no, the, they're, the uh, they're, uh, they're a small crew, I think, Nicola. Um, but you see, if, uh, if no agreed way out uh, was able to be agreed by a pro-Remain Parliament, then the default position was to leave today... Uh, on WTO terms. Yeah. Now, I've said all along, you've heard me, uh, yeah. there's nothing to fear in WTO terms. If there was, then 
most of the world would be in a state of fear because that's the basis on which most of the world trade with the European Union. It's a project fear that we've been subjected to. And most of the world are actually doing quite well. Well, a lot better than the European Union, Nicola. Yes, yes. Well, certainly the Far East, they're they're not uh, uh, having problems, are they? Far from (laughs) it. The sun (laughs) rises in the East. It's it's fading and setting in the West. This is a fundamental strategic misjudgment our rulers have made. Nicola, a lot of people trying to get on. Thanks very yes. much for your call. Let me take Ken in Luton. Go ahead, Ken. Good evening, George. Evening to you, sir. Welcome back. I'm really bloody angry about this. Yeah. Corbyn blew it. He had the biggest mandate a, a Labour leader's had, and he let the Blairites tread all over him. Keir Starmer and his mob. Well, he had a very difficult wicket, uh, Ken. Uh, He became the leader of uh, 500, 600,000 Labour Party members, but he's definitely not the leader of the MPs. No, that's right. And that's where he fell down. And as I say, all them MPs that stood for Labour, that were in leave seats, that voted Remain, they ought to be deselected, and then they'll have to fight somewhere else. Right. Well, yeah, I don't think that'll happen because, by all accounts, although it's never really been scientifically tested, most Labour members uh, agree with them. Uh, what the real danger is is that they'll be voted out by their electorate. That's what I'm saying, George. Because if, if your majority is 1,000, 4,000, 5, 6, 7, 8,000, and all the people that voted for you but also voted leave say... To hell with that! I'm not voting for you again. Then well, they're that's out. What they're going to do, George. If, if if these labour associations are daft enough to put up a remainer when they voted leave, like Shooter is 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 out of the party now. He's on the new lot. I mean, he, he's left Luton South. They they've returned a, a vote and no confidence in him. But because it wasn't an election year, they couldn't sling him out. He left of his own accord because he knew he's... Well, he's in the new uh, the new yeah, party, yeah, which is it. called Change UK, or Chucker, yeah, that... Chucker for short. Yeah, well, who's funding them? Well, they'll have to declare that now. Uh, anyone who donates more than £7,500 to oh, a political funny. party it has to be registered with the Electoral Commission. So we'll soon find that out. Well, the, men, the money men have screwed it all up, haven't they, George? They've got their way. Far too much money in Parliament, far too much lobbying in Parliament, far too George. many uh, fat cats Are employing lobbyists to work on our political system. It's getting Are like the United States, Ken. Yeah, well, a week after we voted, the House of Lords turned around and said we will work at damnedest to overturn it. Nigel Lawson was the only one who stood up for us. And all the others said, oh, no, we'll get that overturned. And they're true to their word, aren't they? Well, they have got it overturned. Uh, They have effectively stymied it, even if the fish is still flapping on the deck. It's not going to get back into the sea. When I try to get on the radio to have a go at this bloody JVS on the radio, he won't listen to me because he won't let me on. He's like you. Anyone who knows what they're talking about, he don't want to know. He wants to slander, sling his blooming hook. I mean, baby. There's a lot of fishing metaphors uh, coming on here. Ken, thanks for the call. Here's Mark in Basildon. Go ahead, Mark. Hello, George. Hi. Uh, George, the thing that got me was when we did the uh, vote, it was what's best for the country. It's not party lines, it's not conservative, it's not um, Labour, mm-hmm. it was for the country. I feel let down by our politicians not looking after the country. It shouldn't be we vote for Labour, we vote for conservatives. It's what's best for us. Well, I, yeah, I mean, uh, Parliament has been voting across party lines uh, throughout on this. I mean, effectively, what Peter O'Born was saying, and he's right, there is uh, a very small 
Corbyn Parliamentary Labour Party. There's a very big Tony Blair Parliamentary Labour Party, which is pro-EU. There's a sizable pro Theresa May, not really Brexit Conservative Party, and a sizable uh, Brexit Party. There's actually yeah, four parties in the two main parties. But the, but the um, MPs represent us. We voted them into power. Mm -hmm. We voted to come out of Europe. Yeah. As such, they should be re representing us as a country, not whether it's conservative or whatever, yeah. on this one issue. Well, yeah, for me, it's, it's a simple it's democratic... Uh, anything else, yeah. I understand that. No, uh, I, I'm, with you, I'm with you uh, on that, Mark. It's simple democracy. If you say we're going to have a referendum and we're going to be bound by the result, and then you're not bound by the result, you are risking severe damage to whatever credibility our democratic system still has. And then if you compound that one year later by holding a general election and promising in your manifesto that you will respect the result of the referendum and you will implement it, and then you don't do that, well, you're risking social peace in the country. I don't say that because I want social peace to be uh, endangered. Far from it. I hate mobs. I don't like trouble and violence. I don't want it. But social peace in Britain has now been risked by 650 extremely comfortable, living in a bubble, Westminster MPs. That's my view, Mark. Yeah, I, I agree, and I'll be honest with you, that as when the next election comes, I don't think the people that are in Parliament, people are going to remember exactly what they did and won't vote back. Well, it depends when that election is. Uh, the European Parliament elections, unfortunately for the political class, are coming up very soon indeed. Thanks for that call, Mark. Let's hear from Martin in Doncaster. Martin, welcome. Hello, George. Hi. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that everyone's been saying. I feel totally betrayed. I did vote leave. I did vote for Jeremy Corbyn. Um, in the Labour Party leadership election, and um, just feel completely frustrated. Um, I think this parliament are actually the enemies of the people and the servants of the establishment, but uh, to a degree that we haven't seen for, I think, since Cromwell's days, actually. And um, I think they're just basically a, a, a bunch of malcontents, m m m misfits and malefactors, um, to use archaic language. I think which very good which, language. Uh, I wish I'd said that. Yeah, indeed. And, um, you know, you, you get um, Labour MPs in West Yorkshire. I'm thinking of Yvette Cooper now. In, she in, promised in the election. I've got her leaflet. Yeah. She promised in a special leaflet to her voters Absolutely. that she would honour the result and implement the result. And I can't remember her ever becoming exercised over austerity, you know, over welfare cuts, over anything. Well, no, no, I have they really. She, she was one of the leaders of the boycott, of the uh, abstention on, uh, on austerity and welfare cuts. But I, I don't know how they, how they can face their electorate, you know, um, when, whilst defying them to this degree. It's, it's just astonishing. I think they're living well, in that's a, why they don't the want an election now, because time heals and they hope that if the election goes all the way to 2022... Uh, people will have moved on. That's what the hope is. Absolutely. That's why I, I doubt there will be an early general election for the reasons Ross said, although yeah. the professor made the point, as did Ross, that actually the government could well just fall apart, and that looks like happening too. Yeah, do you think there's any, any slim chance or vague hope of um, Brexit ever being achieved? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. I think it will happen. I think the genie is out of the bottle, as Nigel Farage put it earlier today. Uh, but uh, there's going to have to be a lot of other battles won before it. If I'm right, and the European Parliament elections elect uh, a, a very clear majority of Brexit MEPs, that will be a new factor on the battlefield. That will be new tanks 
on the political class's lawn? Yeah, well, they, they have done everything um, from <clears throat> the day after the referendum. I think the whole thing has been a huge um, choreographed ballet, including Theresa May's um, so-called uh, wish to uh, deliver Brexit. I think, I think they've all been serving Brussels, basically, and I think it's all been totally choreographed and it's been a balletic exercise. Martin, you are an eloquent man. Thank you very much indeed for that call. Uh, an SMS, I'm going to read it uh, word for word. Uh, of course, it's anonymous. It says, reality check for you, Galloway. One third of the British electorate voted Brexit, while three quarters of elected MPs are for Remain, you gutless coward. So he's calling me a gutless coward, Ofcom. Please note. Uh, George, in December 1969, Keith Campbell, Labour MP for Oldham West, said by joining the common market a decision which, for good or ill, will result in Britain ceasing to be a completely sovereign state because she will be required to shed at least part of her independence. As such, nobody can deny that she will cease to be a completely sovereign power. Those words spoken 50 years ago are a perfect description of the situation we find ourselves in today. That's from Ian Aston in the West Midlands. Uh, Mr. Austin says, I wouldn't be surprised if 17.4 million people never cast their vote again. Well, that would be a mistake. That's what they want. Neil Salter says, Professor John Curtis is wrong on who will abandon Labour. The young liberal left would still have voted for Labour's other policies on free education and cheap housing, but Labour's working class, northern base, will be less forgiving on Brexit. Uh, that's from Neil. Mal in Belfast says, I don't know if you've covered this, but isn't it very interesting that France and Germany have set up their own joined parliament inside the EU27 to look after their own interests. Isn't it interesting that Ireland are not included in that setup, seeing that this is the main stumbling block? Would it be better if Ireland got together with the UK for their own interests and trading bloc? To me, Ireland are being used as France and Germany's bargaining tool, and they are carving up the EU into the haves and have-nots. I think Germany and France have taken full control. They've always had full control, Mal. I do uh, note that the professor, uh, sorry, the president of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, uh, had a good go at the EU's economic policies. I read that this morning. Helen Lakin says, uh, please can you explain why we won't now leave with no deal on 12th April? Heard Jacob Rees-Mogg say this was not the now default position. I thought the extension was till April if her deal was not passed. Please clarify. Looking forward to a good show. Well, I don't know if Jacob said that. If he did say it, I believe he's wrong. Uh, the default position is still exit on WTO terms on the 12th of April unless something else is done to divert that. Uh, Andrew says, Theresa May has knocked at the door thrice and thrice been rejected. Her spirit indeed is willing, but her flesh is weak. Time for her last supper. And Chris says, never before have I been so disgusted by the sheer incompetent and utterly dishonest behaviour shown by the majority of our MPs. I will never trust another word or promise that these duplicitous people say ever again. And John in Cheshire says an easy way for Labour to win the next general election is to promise an EU referendum within six months after the general election. The referendum should consist of two options, 100% remain or 100% out, no caveats, codicils or grey areas. The problem with that, John, is that Labour would commit itself to the remain side and so would suffer electoral consequences as a result. Charlie Fakel Ross says, talking about party manif manifestos, how's about a mention for the SNP's Westminster and Holyrood manifestos? Or do theirs don't count? I think 
uh, that's not your best uh, SMS, Charlie. And Chris says, how can we ever again preach to other countries about democracy when we don't even have it here anymore? I'm outraged about MPs' behaviour. David Leviscont, another bad day for May's subversive shotgun politics. Why is it proven impossible for any nation to leave the EU? Well, do you know the words of the Eagles song, Hotel California? You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. This is, I think, a rasping mother of all talk shows, but it depends on you to provide the all-important balance. 0344 499 1000, that's the number to call. Or you can email via the website at talkradio.co.uk. You can text the word TALK, followed by your message, to 8722, though that will cost you 25 pence plus normal charges. Or you can tweet me, at George Galloway, at Talk Radio. Lots still to come. I'm happy to see that the funny-tinged Tamar Asfahani has made it safely back into the studio. He escaped the clutches of the Robinson knuckle-draggers, and I am very glad to see him. There's lots more coming up. Stay tuned on the mother of all talk shows. Well, over a million uh, said you should go, but the members of Parliament, overwhelmingly hostile to that idea, have finally, well, perhaps not finally, but almost finally, scuppered Brexit, and people are angry about it. Though, by the law of averages, that must mean there are millions of people who are happy about it. If you're one of those on either side, give me a call, 0344 499 one thousand. Ricky in Glasgow has. He's up next. Ricky, welcome to the show. Thanks, George. Thank you. Nice to hear um, from you. Go ahead. Thank you. Now, just the comments you made about Cromwell's comments on the Parliament of the time. Yeah. I think I think we must question it. Perhaps it's very accurate in this day and age. The same comments, but perhaps in this day and age, where everybody's got a vote. Perhaps the Commons is just reflecting the incompetence or the indecisions of the community at large. No, I think so. I don't, Ricky. I'll tell you why. Um, both the main parties stood for the general election in 2017 on a manifesto, both of them, which yes. explicitly stated that they would respect yes. the result of the referendum and implement it. And therefore, in my view, oh. both of them are guilty of duplicity and deception over the 80% of the British people who voted for them. Well, I was wanting to have a wee argument with you, but I can't. I have to agree with you. It's nothing, there's no dispute what you've just said. I think it's uh, disgraceful, actually. Yeah, there's you see, much, if, it was just, if it was just the referendum result, you could argue the toss. But if it's well, a referendum in 2016 and then a general election in 2017 and the people yeah. elected to the parliament in 2017 then betray their promise to the electorate, yes. I can't accept oh, yes, that. This, That's why I said, Ricky, a couple of weeks sir. ago, if you were listening, I said, this is no longer about Brexit. No, it was last week. This is no longer about Brexit. This is about democracy. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah I know what you're saying. Um, the only thing is, with the referendum, it uh, updated the system that we're all familiar with. First past the post, and the levers were first past the post, and that's the system we use here. Yeah. Uh, we should now be out of Europe. Everything else is shameful, I think. I'm having difficulty just arguing with you, but I'll find something somewhere along the line. Ah, well, well, maybe on the football <laughs> or something, but we'll, uh, we'll agree to <laughs> okay. agree so, uh, on uh, this no, one. It's interesting you made that comment about Cromwell. It crossed my mind. This whole thing seems shameful. Just, I think you know, so. I, I, you know, I, I described it earlier as a Lilliputian parliament. It's a parliament of small people. Uh, yes, there are yes. very, very few parliamentarians that would be recognised if they walked out on the street uh, from yes. Westminster. Yes. Uh, you, I always make the point, Ricky, I don't know what age you are, but uh, ha, ha, when Harold Wilson was the Prime Minister, there was yes. at least 10 
prime ministers in waiting, 10, sitting in his cabinet, and most of them were trying to become the prime minister. But they were yeah. giant household names, big figures, even in yeah, an yeah, era with no yeah, social yeah, media, even in an era That's with le true, much yeah. less TV. They were... Yeah. They were demonstrably big beasts, yes. and we just so don't just have see, that anymore. Yeah, they're just minnows we've got. We'd appear now. We've got minnows. There's no, no matter which side you're on. We don't seem to have. You know, there are two or three come through in their honesty, but overall, I can't argue with you. Um, I think it's shame, maybe, and sadness we've got here that. Uh, that's what we voted in. But we voted them in, George. That was well, that's decision. it. That's it. As I always say, Ricky, if you vote in donkeys, don't expect them <laughs> to do anything other than hee-haw. <laughs> Thank you, Ricky, for that nice call. Let's hear from Nicola in Swindon. Go ahead, Nicola. Good evening to you, George. Good evening. Uh, we're in a bit of a mess with Brexit. Yes. Uh, to be honest, to I mean, say I, the voted, least. I voted to come out and... There was a couple of reasons. One of it was I wanted our own MPs, our own parliament, to take responsibility to, to make the laws and to be in charge of this country and to make decisions. And uh, I think I was a bit deluded, really, because they, they haven't even been out to be able to sort of agree on a way out. And I feel, uh, I feel a bit disappointed, uh, really, to be totally honest. I actually thought we had the sort of... The, the wherewithal in Parliament for actually people to sort of make a decision and do something. But uh, I don't know, perhaps we've got the, the wrong people there. As you say, we don't have the big names there anymore, do we? The, no, the, they're, the uh, they're, uh, they're a small crew, I think, Nicola. Um, but you see, if, uh, if no agreed way out uh, was able to be agreed by a pro-Remain Parliament, then the default position was to leave today... Uh, on WTO terms. Yeah. Now, I've said all along, you've heard me, uh, yeah. there's nothing to fear in WTO terms. If there was, then most of the world would be in a state of fear because that's, that's the basis on which most of the world trade with the that's European it. Union. Yes. It's a project fear that we've been subjected to. And most of the world are actually doing quite well. Well, a lot better ideas. than the European Union, Nicola. Yes, yes. Well, certainly the Far East, they're, they're not uh, uh, having problems, are they? No, far <laughs> from it. The <laughs> sun rises in the East. It's, yeah. it's fading and setting yeah. in the West. You're this is a fundamental Barbara, strategic yeah. misjudgment our rulers have yeah. made. Nicola, a lot of people trying to get on. Thanks very yeah. much for your call. Let me take Ken in Luton. Go ahead, Ken. Good evening, George. Evening to you, sir. Welcome back. I'm really bloody angry about this. Yeah. Corbyn blew it. He had the biggest mandate a, a Labour leader's had, and he let the Blairites tread all over him. Keir Starmer and his mob. Well, he had a very difficult wicket, uh, Ken. Uh, he became the leader of... Uh, 500, 600,000 Labour Party members, but he's definitely not the leader of the MPs. No, that's right. And that's where he fell down. And as I say, all them MPs that stood for Labour, that were in leave seats, that voted Remain, they ought to be deselected, and then they'll have to fight somewhere else. Right. Well, yeah, I don't think that'll happen because, by all accounts, although it's never really been scientifically tested, most Labour members uh, agree with them. Uh, what the real danger is is that they'll be voted out by their electorate. That's what I'm saying, George. Because if, if your majority is 1,000, 4,000, 5, 6, 7, 8,000, and all the people that voted for you but also voted leave say to hell with that, I'm not voting for you again, then well, they're that's out. What they're going to do, George. If, if, if these Labour associations are daft enough to put up a Remainer when they voted leave, like Shooter, he's, he's, he's out of the party now. He's on the new lot. I mean, he, he's left Luton South. They, they've returned a, a vote and no confidence in him. But because it wasn't an election year, they couldn't sling him out. 
he left of his own accord because he knew he'd, well he's, he's in the new uh, the new yeah, party yeah, which is it. called Change UK or Chucka yeah, that, Chucka for short yeah well who's funding them well, they'll have to declare that now. Uh, anyone who donates more than £7,500 to oh, a political well, party it has to be registered with the Electoral Commission. So we'll soon find that out. Well, the, men, the money men have screwed it all up, haven't they, George? They've got their way. Far too much money in Parliament, far too much lobbying in Parliament, far too George. many uh, fat cats but employing lobbyists to work on our political system. It's getting like the can't. United States, Ken. Yeah, well, a week after we voted, the House of Lords turned around and said we will work at Diamondist to overturn it. Nigel Lawson was the only one who stood up for us. And all the others said, oh, no, we'll get that overturned. And they're true to their word, aren't they? Well, they have got it overturned. Uh, They have effectively stymied it, even if the fish is still flapping on the deck. It's not going to get back into the sea. When I try to get on the radio to have a go at this bloody JVS on the radio, he won't listen to me because he won't let me on. He's like you. Anyone who knows what they're talking about, he don't want to know. He wants to slander, sling his blooming hook. I mean, baby. There's a lot of fishing metaphors uh, coming on here. Ken, thanks for the call. Here's Mark in Basildon. Go ahead, Mark. Hello, George. Hi. Uh, George, the thing that got me was when we did the uh, vote, it was what's best for the country. It's not party lines. It's not conservative. It's not um, Labour. Mm-hmm. It was for the country. I feel let down by our politicians not looking after the country. It shouldn't be we vote for Labour, we vote for Conservatives. It's what's best for us. Well, I, yeah, I mean, uh, Parliament has been voting across party lines uh, throughout on this. I mean, effectively, what Peter Oborn was saying, and he's right, there is uh, a very small Corbyn Parliamentary Labour Party. There's a very big Tony Blair Parliamentary Labour Party, which is pro-EU. There's a sizable pro Theresa May, not really Brexit Conservative Party, and a sizable uh, Brexit Party. There's actually four parties in the two main parties. But the the, um, MPs represent us. We voted them into power. Mm-hmm. We voted to come out of Europe. Yeah. As such, they should be re- representing us as a country, not whether it's conservative or whatever yeah. on this one well, issue. Yeah, for me, it's, it's a simple it's democratic... Uh, anything else, yeah. I understand that. No, uh, I, I'm, with issue, you, I'm with you uh, on that, Mark. It's simple democracy. If you say we're going to have a referendum and we're going to be bound by the result, and then you're not bound by the result, you are risking severe damage to whatever credibility our democratic system still has. And then if you compound that one year later by holding a general election and promising in your manifesto that you will respect the result of the referendum and you will implement it, and then you don't do that, well, you're risking social peace in the country. I don't say that because I want social peace to be uh, endangered. Far from it. I hate mobs. I don't like trouble and violence. I don't want it. But social peace in Britain has now been risked by 650 extremely comfortable, living in a bubble, Westminster MPs. That's my view, Mark. I I agree, and I'll be honest with you, that as when the next election comes, I don't think the people that are in Parliament, people are going to remember exactly what they did and won't vote back. Well, it depends when that election is. Uh, The European Parliament elections, unfortunately for the political class, are coming up very soon indeed. Thanks for that call, Mark. Let's hear from Martin in Doncaster. Martin, welcome. Hello, George. Hi. Um, 
Yeah, I, I agree with everything that everyone's been saying. I feel totally betrayed. I did vote Leave. I did vote for Jeremy Corbyn um, in the Labour Party leadership election. And um, just feel completely frustrated. Um, I think this parliament are actually the enemies of the people and the servants of the establishment, but uh, to a degree that we haven't seen for, I think, since Cromwell's days, actually. And... Um, I think they're just basically a, a, a bunch of malcontents, misfits and malefactors, um, to use archaic language. I think which it's very good which, language. I wish I'd said that. Yeah, indeed. And um, you know, you, you get um, Labour MPs in West Yorkshire. I'm thinking of Yvette Cooper now. In, she in, promised in the election. I've got her leaflet. Yeah. She promised in a special leaflet to her voters Absolutely. that she would. Honour the result and implement the result. And I can't remember her ever becoming excised over austerity, you know, over welfare cuts, over anything. And oh, no, no, I have the really. She, she was one of the leaders of the boycott of the uh, abstention Absolutely. on uh, on austerity and welfare cuts. But I, I don't know how they how they can face their electorate, you know, um, when whilst defying them to this degree, it's, it's just astonishing. I think they're living well, in Well, that's why they don't the want an election now, because time heals and they hope that if the election goes all the way to 2022, uh, people will have moved on. That's what the hope is. Absolutely. That's why I, I doubt there will be an early general election for the reasons Ross said, although yeah. the professor made the point, as did Ross, that actually the government could well just fall apart and... That looks like happening too. Yeah, do you think there's any any slim chance or vague hope of um, Brexit ever being achieved? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. I think it will happen. I think the genie is out of the bottle, as Nigel Farage put it earlier today. Uh, but uh, there's going to have to be a lot of other battles won before it. If I'm right, and the European Parliament elections elect. Uh, a, a very clear majority of Brexit MEPs. That will be a new factor on the battlefield. That will be new tanks on the political class's lawn. Yeah, well, they, they have done everything um, from <clears throat> the day after the referendum. I think the whole thing has been a huge um, choreographed ballet, including Theresa May's... Um, so-called uh, wish to uh, deliver Brexit. I think I think they've all been serving Brussels, basically, and I think it's all been totally choreographed and it's been a balletic exercise. Martin, you are an eloquent man. Thank you very much indeed for that call. Uh, an SMS, I'm going to read it uh, word for word. Uh, of course, it's anonymous. It says, reality check for you, Galloway. One third of the British electorate voted Brexit while well, three quarters of elected MPs are for Remain, you gutless coward. So he's calling me a gutless coward, Ofcom. Please note, uh, George, in December 1969, Keith Campbell, Labour MP for Oldham West, said by joining the common market, a decision which, for good or ill, will result in Britain ceasing to be a completely sovereign state because she will be required to shed at least part of her independence. As such, nobody can deny that she will cease to be a completely sovereign power. Those words, spoken 50 years ago, are a perfect description of the situation we find ourselves in today. That's from Ian Aston in the West Midlands. Uh, Mr. Austin says, I wouldn't be surprised if 17.4 million people never cast their vote again. Well, that would be a mistake. That's what they want. Neil Salter says, Professor John Curtis is wrong on who will abandon Labour. The young liberal left would still have voted for Labour's other policies on free education and cheap housing, but Labour's working class, Northern base, will be less forgiving on Brexit. Uh, that's from Neil. Mal in Belfast says... I don't know if you've covered this, but isn't it very interesting that France and Germany have set up their own joined parliament inside the EU27 to look after their own interests? Isn't it interesting that Ireland are not included in that setup, seeing that this is the main stumbling block? 
Would it be better if Ireland got together with the UK for their own interests and trading bloc? To me, Ireland are being used as France and Germany's bargaining tool, and they are carving up the EU into the haves and have-nots. I think Germany and France have taken full control. They've always had full control, Mal. I do uh, note that the professor, uh, sorry, the president of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, uh, had a good go at the EU's economic policies. I read that this morning. Helen Lakin says, uh, please can you explain why we won't now leave with no deal on 12th April? Heard Jacob Rees-Mogg say this was not the now default position. I thought the extension was till April if her deal was not passed. Please clarify. Looking forward to a good show. Well, I don't know if Jacob said that. If he did say it, I believe he's wrong. Uh, the default position is still exit on WTO terms on the 12th of April, unless something else is done to divert that. Uh, Andrew says, Theresa May has knocked at the door thrice and thrice been rejected. Her spirit indeed is willing, but her flesh is weak. Time for her last supper. And Chris says, never before have I been so disgusted by the sheer incompetent and utterly dishonest behaviour shown by the majority of our MPs. I will never trust another word or promise that these duplicitous people say ever again. And John in Cheshire says an easy way for Labour to win the next general election is to promise an EU referendum within six months after the general election. The referendum should consist of two options, 100% remain or 100% out, no caveats, codicils or grey areas. The problem with that, John, is that Labour would commit itself to the remain side and so would suffer electoral consequences as a result. Charlie Fakel Ross says, talking about party manif manifestos, how's about a mention for the SNP's Westminster and Holyrood manifestos? Or do theirs don't count? I think uh, that's not your best uh, SMS, Charlie. And Chris says, how can we ever again preach to other countries about democracy when we don't even have it here anymore. I'm outraged about MPs' behaviour. David Leviscont, another bad day for May's subversive shotgun politics. Why is it proven impossible for any nation to leave the EU? Well, do you know the words of the Eagles' song, Hotel California? You can check out any time you like but you can never leave. This is, I think, a rasping mother of all talk shows, but it depends on you to provide the all-important balance. 0344 499 1000, that's the number to call. Or you can email via the website at talkradio.co.uk. You can text the word TALK followed by your message to 8722, though that will cost you 25 pence plus normal charges. Or you can tweet me at George Galloway at Talk Radio. Lots still to come. I'm happy to see that the funny-tinged Tamar Asfahani has made it safely back into the studio. He escaped the clutches of the Robinson knuckle-draggers. And I am very glad to see him. There's lots more coming up. Stay tuned on the mother of all talk shows. I think I better leave right now. Feeling weaker and weaker. Somebody better show me how. Before I fall any deeper. I love that song, actually. That's why I let it go for just a little bit uh, longer. And, of course, it's... Uh, the only thing I've been asked about over the last few weeks has been about Brexit. But the United States has had much bigger issues to deal with itself. As regular listeners know, I was not happy that Donald Trump got elected as president of the United States, but I was very happy that Hillary Clinton didn't. And the reason for that was his promise 
to reinvigorate the rust belt of working class America uh, and to stop the shipping out of American jobs to cheap labor countries uh, and to reset America's relationships with the rest of the world, including uh, Russia. No sooner had he been elected than what I regarded, because I know some things, as I've told you before, uh, I know them, it's not a question of conjecture. I know that uh, WikiLeaks did not hack the Democratic National Committee. I know that. I know that the information from the DNC was a leak, not a hack. A leak from someone inside America, inside the Democratic Party. That I know. I can't tell you how I know or I'd need to kill you. But I know it. And so I believed from the start that this Russia gate, brouhaha, which has paralyzed America since Trump was elected, was a crock, as the Americans say. But week after week, people would tell me, Mueller is this, Mueller is that. He's closing in. Trump's going to jail. His family are going to jail. One half-wit, former MP of this parish, and now an American, or living in America, actually stated in public that Donald Trump would be executed, executed for treason at the end of the Mueller inquiry. Didn't turn out that way because the Mueller report exculpates Donald Trump, and Russia for that matter, of any collusion at all. Let's hear from the superb U.S. investigative reporter, man that used to be at Breitbart, now has his own radio show, which I appear on from time to time. He's Lee Stranahan, and I welcome him to the show tonight. Lee, welcome. Hey, George. Please and honored to be with you. No, I'm um, right, Lee. So, I'm entire, it, it turned out to be a crock. Well, it did, but I got to – well, there's two parts to this, though. So really, to understand what was going on here, the, I, I've been saying for some time now that the target of this was not Donald Trump but Vladimir Putin, that, the, that Trump was collateral damage here. And you can see that the report – uh, says that there was no collusion, but it affirms that says that there was a le Russian election interference. And I contest that. There was not a Russian election interference. And one of the accusations, the one about Facebook ads, is laughable. It's about $40,000 that uh, most of the ads have nothing to do with the election. And that does not sound like a state run uh, Intel op to me. There's just nothing about it that seems like a state actor at all. And, and horribly ineffective, nothing, it's just ridiculous. And the, the other thing is this indictment where there's literally not a shred of proof. So what they've done is they've accepted the premise that Russia is bad, and that was the whole point. And it, things have gotten ginned up so badly in America the past couple of years that we had James Clapper, former uh, director of national intelligence, literally say that Russians are, I'm, as a quote, genetically dishonest. Uh, about a year ago, genetically dishonest. Who could he say that about? And it would be like, and it, and there wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't be immediately fired from his job common at CNN, right? That, nobody. You couldn't say that about anybody. And yet he said it about the Russians. And that's how quickly things have have uh, come to a boil here. Uh, yeah, it's Russia. kind of a mania, isn't it, Lee? It's the kind of mania that existed when Ethel and Julius Rosenberg went to the electric chair. Yeah, but it, it's well, and here's the problem they don't have an ideology, but also, you know, you've got players in this who were major players, like the uh, what you know, one of the big proofs of collusion was the Trump Tower meeting. Well, that Trump Tower meeting was about a guy named Bill Browder. Bill Browder's out of London. Bill Browder, his attorney, Jonathan Weyer, and his lobbyist. The guy behind the Magnitsky Act, which is what that meeting was about, is this guy, Jonathan Weiner. He is the guy who brought Christopher Steele 
into the State Department and was being briefed by him. Nobody's reported that in the U.S. That's a big detail that the guy who the Magnitsky Act, the Trump Tower meeting was about, his, his lawyer was being briefed by Christopher Steele. What? Christopher Steele, the connected. author of the, of the dossier. Of the dossier. That's the dirty exactly right. dossier. And, and, and so nobody's brought this sort of thing up. And so I was just talking to uh, someone from 60 Minutes about this, actually, and just saying, because well, a, lot, a lot of the media right now, some of the more honest members, and there's about six of them, are looking at this going, what can we learn from this fiasco? But, but most people, almost nobody has, uh, had, has really wants to think about what a, what an information disaster this was. How every day, it's very hard to imagine. I mean, I can't imagine, George, what it's like right now with Brexit. What I, I, we had a guest in the show, and I said, it must be wearing, because all you hear about all day must be Brexit. I, I yeah, can, yeah, no, you're right. It is comparable, yeah. And so over here in the States, all you heard about every, every day, every network, Trump collusion, Trump collusion, Russians, da 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 Every day. Oh, this is going to be the week. They're going to impeach him this week. This witness is going to flip on him, and nothing ever happened. It was two years. And uh, I, I mean, just think of that, two years. And so people haven't quite figured out their way out of the fog yet on it. Yeah. and it's, But it's going to backfire for Trump, isn't it? I mean, they've given him uh, the... They've given him the main planks of his manifesto for the for the second term. Yeah, they. I think it'll backfire to some extent. There's a lot of stuff like the thing I said about demonizing Russia. Let's let's talk about that. That's not that's not uh, academic. Right now, if you look at things that are going on, Pompeo has said uh, the United uh, the Secretary of State in the U.S. has said that the U.S. is going to. Uh, engage with Russia, uh, engage with Ukraine uh, with actions against Russia. That just came out. They're ordering, they say they want Russians to leave Venezuela, even though we don't control that company, a country, it's their foreign policy. Uh, and with you were Syria right the first right time, now, company. They want it to be a company. No, that's right. And with Syria right now, of course, uh, there's, there's pressure on the Russians there. So this ginning up of things against uh, Russia, look at what's happened in the last week. All of these hotspots suddenly involve Russia. So they're kind of slingshotting off of the, uh, you know, Devin Nunez, big politician here in Congress, immediately said, we need to investigate the Russians. And you'd go, well, you said there was no collusion. Oh, yeah, but there was interference. And I'm saying, no, there was no interference either. There was not. Wow. So Trump, is, Trump presumably has taken it as a vindication, even though he's got many other problems. I mean, he's paying off hookers and uh, 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 he's got all kinds of uh, difficulties, not all of them federal, uh, but all kinds of investigations that are continuing. But he presumably is ignoring them and talking only about the Mueller report now. So part of this has always, part of this operation has always been to keep Trump back uh, on his heels and defensive. And they, there's two ways they could have got him. They, they didn't want him elected. The people who were behind this uh, operation to tie him to Russia, which, is, it, which went back before the election, um, there are two ways they could have got to him. It's people connected to NATO and, 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 and that group of military you know, alliance people. So there's U.K. people, there's, there's the British people, but they didn't want Trump to win. Once they won, what they wanted to do, and this is the Henry Jackson Society crowd, that group in London. Once he won, they slowly got rid of anything that was good about his foreign policy, which was quite a bit about. He ran as a non-interventionist, more or less, right? A little bit, you know, hawkish, but basically, like, we shouldn't be nation-building. That changed. Look who's in there now, Bolton, Pompeo, and they are. They have full bore kept up the policies of the Obama administration in Syria, in Ukraine, and uh, as, as we know, as, as you know, George, the U.S. To Syria policy has been horrible from day one. We caused we caused that situation, and we were backing the wrong people. We were backing the head choppers, 
and uh, we're backing them against Christians. And it was never reported here in the U.S. And I, I was hopeful there'd be some change when Trump came in. Instead, nope, we're getting the same thing, and they've doubled down on it in places like Ukraine. And so it's very, very dangerous because, again, I, I, I think part of this is demonizing Russia as really the only country that stands up to the U.S. Uh, as they uh, sort of move, move, move yeah. toward... Well, I don't think that's going to change, Lee. Uh, I don't think the Russians are going to pack their cases and leave Venezuela just because Hippo, Hippo Pompeo uh, told them to. Thanks very much, Lee. We're going to have to talk again because I need to take a break for some capitalist messages. Now, first of all, uh, I need to ask you to do two things. I need you to subscribe, it's entirely free, to my YouTube channel. That's George Galloway Official. Uh, I've got 33,500. I really need for it to go much, much higher than that. So please subscribe to my YouTube channel, George Galloway Official. And secondly, I'm speaking in yet another of my spectacular shows with Ken Livingston, The Outsiders Tour at the Dance House in Manchester, in Oxford Road, Manchester, next Saturday. That's not tomorrow, but next Saturday. There are still tickets available from the venue. So that's me and Ken, The Outsiders, at the Dance House in Oxford Road, Manchester, on the 6th of April. I need you to snap up those tickets. And I need you to go and see a new film called Eaten by Lions. Because if you watch my television program tomorrow uh, on Sky 511, uh, it's uh, one of the things we featured there is the young man who is right at the center of that film. He's a phenomenon. I'm telling you now, you heard it from me. If you don't know of his work yet, I promise you, you certainly will. I've never met a young talent that I was more sure was going to make it big. I only hope he remembers me when he is big. He's Hollywood bound. Jack is a British comedian, writer and actor. Very clever boy, by the way. He competed in the seventh series of Britain's Got Talent at the age of 14 and finished up as runner-up. As an actor, he has appeared in two series of the CBBC channel show Ministry of Curious Stuff, which is brilliant, by the way. And most recently, and this is where I first saw him, he starred in the new series of Trollid. But he's got a film out, which is a, a fantastic day out to Blackpool. And I like Blackpool. I like the promenade. It's set on the promenade in the sunshine in Blackpool. Basically, two half-brothers embarking on a haphazard road trip to the bright lights of Blackpool. The director is Jason Wingard. It's a bittersweet, multicultural buddy comedy. Co-written by David Isaacs, eaten by lions, purrs gently for 95 minutes with a couple of uproarious interludes that play to the strengths of Britain's Got Talent finalist, Jack Carroll, who pokes fun at his cerebral palsy in his stand-up routines. That's right, Jack's got cerebral palsy. Not as severely as many people have it, and thus he is not just a stand-up comedian, he's a real stand-up guy who gets around gets about, and what a brain, quick-witted, incredibly funny. How's that for a build-up, Jackie? Well, that's a lot of pressure to, uh, to live up to there. But, well, uh, well, I must that, say, that, you, you impress me a lot, Jack. Oh, well, thank you, man. It, it, it means a lot because it's, uh, it's great to be able to... Uh, well, you're a listener to the show. Your... You're a listener to this show. Absolutely, long time listener, first time caller. I can say, I hope the same goes. Um, <laughs> tell, yeah, us, uh, tell us about the movie, Jack. Yeah, so like you said, it's the uh, the story of two half brothers, uh, Pete and Omar, who, when their parents die, uh, set off to Blackpool to look, uh, look for Omar's real dad, who turned out to be a huge disappointment. It's sort of a, a story which 
with folks. I think multicultural Britain and um, you know is a is a journey of self discovery uh, self discovery for for both the boys. I think. Now, how much how much of yourself are you playing in this role? Um, I mean, I've. <laughs> I uh, the, the, my character Pete is a um, uh, sarcastic, uh, semi-annoying teenage boy with a walking frame, so it's not a huge stretch for me to play. I don't think <laughs> I'll be. Uh, I don't think I'll be typecast as any sort of character actor after this film. But um, <laughs> obviously, there are, there are similarities and a few things that he does that I would never ever in a million years do. So uh, I just want to make that clear as well. <laughs> But you have a beautiful family and a beautiful family life. In fact, you have made it because your uncle filmed you. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, the first time I ever performed stand-up comedy was at my uh, parents' silver wedding anniversary, and that was filmed by my uncle, who then uploaded it to YouTube, and that uh, caught fire on the local TV news, and that sort of... uh, the uh, the starting point for you know the situation I find myself in today. today. So uh, I'm very grateful to to the help of others and uh, very aware of the fact that I'm really only here due to other people's help. Well, how does your uncle feel now that you you went on from that to Britain's Got Talent, then to the television? Now you're on the cinema. Yeah, absolutely. I'm. Uh, I'm told that they're all very proud, and uh, you know that that means a lot as well. That uh, people have been able to to help me uh, achieve this. Definitely, That's fantastic, mate. Now tell us about Omar. Uh, so uh, Omar, played by the uh, the fantastic Antonio Keel, is a sort of he's a lost soul, really. He's a, he's an Asian, uh, South Asian, uh, brought up by a white family, uh, sort of a little bit removed, I think, from his, his cultural identity and that and his story in the film is sort of about that uh journey into blackpool in search of uh, he's desperate to meet he's desperate to meet cultural. his dad who he knows then does he that the dad is in blackpool yeah so he knows he knows the dad is in blackpool but he, he initially thinks that it is another character in the film uh malik played by nissan ganassi and there's a there's a sort of uh, hilarious misunderstanding, comedy of errors yeah, scene uh, yeah. in the film where that, that gets explained. Uh, uh, of course, we're not going to spoil it for all the people who are going to go and see it, so don't tell us the uh, the conclusion. Uh, but you yeah. say you 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 say it's a disappointment. Is there for a sad ending? No, it's a happy ending because I think all the characters. Um, eventually uh, sort of tread that road to redemption and eventually come to certain conclusions about the importance of family and the importance of community and how to... Um, how to I, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of focus in media nowadays, uh, even in left-wing media, about uh, division and, you know, what makes us different. And I think Eat by Lions at its heart is a film about uh, commonality. It's a top uh, title, I must say, and titles are so uh, important, eaten by uh, lions. Just finally, what was it like filming in Blackpool? How were you received on the on the on the promenade? Well, the uh, the locals were fantastic, and uh, I think that's due to the fact um, that we were able to show Blackpool in such a positive light, which unfortunately, you know, it's not always uh, shown in that that positive light, and I think. They, they they really you know warm to that and welcomed us with open arms and it's great to include such landmarks as the tower and the lights I think that was a really fantastic you opportunity. You even got you even um, got some some good weather in the stills I've seen. Absolutely, I think we've we've done we've done God and the tourist board's work I think there <laughs> um, and there'll be there'll be a lot of people uh, turning up in Blackpool who've been. Uh, you know, sold a dream. And it well, I totally love Blackpool. Uh, I won't have a bad word uh, said against it. Now, it's mm. out in the cinemas today. How does that feel, Jack? Did, were you in a cinema to see it today with a real crowd? I uh, I wasn't. I'm aiming to go uh, the sort of beginning of next week. Uh, so that'll be, that'll be a very surreal experience, I'm sure. But it's great to be able to get it to this point and finally uh, finally share Well, it's your first film, but uh, definitely not your last. I'm absolutely sure about that. Is tr- what about Trolled? Is that going to come back? I totally love Trolled. 
Oh, thank you. Well, solid. I think we uh, we did the final special uh, over Christmas, which everyone seemed to be happy with, and it was good to be able to give those characters a proper send off. And uh, you know, never say never. Definitely, never say never. And let me just remind everyone listening: you are now the princely age of twenty years old. Am I right? Indeed, yes, 20. I'm basically an old man now. Well, that's the thing. When you start as young as 14, um, the, the, the difficult thing is to keep that going and to adapt when you're 30, when you're 40, when you're 50. Uh, you're going to stick in show business now, I hope so, because you're totally brilliant at it. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's, um, it's great to be able to, you know, I think I've, I've found out what I want to do with my life quite early on. And... Um, it is about that perseverance and that struggle and that longevity, I think, and it will be um, will be something I, you know, I, I do hope to carry on with. You you like making people laugh, but also moving them. Indeed, I think you know the the, the two things are inter, interconnected, and you know if you if you can make someone laugh, I think you can also smuggle some ideas in at the same time, and that's what the the best comedy for me does is it makes you laugh and also. You know, in in equal measure, makes you makes you think really. Jack, God bless you, and all power to your career. And I hope the film is watched uh, in the tens, scores of thousands. Thanks very much for joining us on the Mother of All Talk Shows. That's Jack Carroll, comedian, writer, actor, aged twenty, with cerebral palsy, and I promise you, he'll make you laugh until your sides hurt. His new film, Eaten by Lions, out today. I want to send uh, a get well message uh, to my good friend, Brian Travers of UB40. I really hope everything goes well for you, Brian. We have a lot of things to do together. So I know you're going to face the op with uh, the fortitude that you've shown all your life, the resilience, the drive, the courage, and I look forward to touring with you when you get better. Michael is in Clacton on Sea. Let's hear from him. Michael, go ahead. Hi, good evening, George. Hi. Uh, hi, I want to challenge you on your um, uh, your appraisal of, of democracy or, or how everybody rates democracy. Sure, go ahead. I, and, and also the fact of the disingenuousness of MPs. Go um, ahead, yeah. Yeah. MPs have a very difficult job. They get pulled in various directions because of party, you know, allegiance, but, you know, and then allegiance to their, um, their the people who vote for them. Um, it, it's a complicated job. And, and people like you, I really like you, but... You do play on this thing where, as a lot of people do, and this is the um, general um, problem with argument these days, you're either good or you're bad. You, nobody is ever in between. Nobody is, you know, they're either being evil or good. And generally it's, it's MPs are evil uh, and they're, they're, they've got their own issues. And um, it's, you know, this, is, this makes the argument so poor, so shallow, um, it, all these things are complicated, and to you know, the, the, to say that um, the 17.4 million aren't getting their way and it's not democracy is rubbish. Why? Um, Why is it rubbish? Well, well, well it, it's rubbish because that you can't deny that they won the vote. It was a very close vote. Not that uh, close. More than a million, uh, Michael. Yeah, but as a percentage of the whole yeah, thing... Well, no, it's not percentages, is it? It's votes we're talking about, and oh. the majority was more than a million. Yes, but... That's a lot of people. No, as, a, as a percentage of the, the total, it's not a large percentage. No, but it, I'm not talking about percentages. I'm talking about people. More than a million people more voted for Brexit than for Remain. On that day, yes. On the day, yes. And, and we know that there were lies on both sides. But... OK, so you win the vote, OK, but then do you when, you... when you win a vote, you want it to end up well. And when you um, have this, um, you, you don't suspend common sense 
And what a lot of the MPs are trying to do is bring common sense to a very binary in or out question. Yeah, which, but that no, was the not, question, Mike. I know, and it was a poor question. So you have the question, you won it. So I'm, I'm a lever. I, I definitely, I'm a, a conspiracy theorist. And I hate the EU with a passion, but I don't want it to be, I don't want 100,000 jobs to go, possibly. Uh, you know, I'm in the South and I'm, I'm retiring and, you know, or approaching retirement. It, it won't affect me. But we have to be very careful with this thing. You know, there's no, we can't just flick a switch and go back. We, when we leave, we leave and we're, we're wherever we are. I mean, we've had um, hard times before. And, you know, but it's a, it's a hard world out there. And for youngsters, um, opportunities are far less these days than they were back when we were younger. So we have to be very careful for the, for, for the rest of, you know, for the people in the country. Yeah, the problem is, Michael, all of these points were made during the referendum campaign and the people voted the way they voted. Yes, but, the, but and on the day you've won it, right? So you you've won yeah, the. Yeah, you see that. Can, but then let, you have I'll let you back in, Michael. But you... let, let me respond to what you've said so far, and I, I promise I'll let you back in uh, to have the final word. Uh, first of all, I've got to tell you, uh, being an MP isn't a hard job. Actually, being an MP is the easiest job I've no, ever no, had. That, John, no, no, George, Mike, Michael, uh, as Diane Abbott once put it, uh, uh, it's uh, clean. There's no heavy lifting, uh, you're out the rain, and it's good wages. So don't ask me to shed any tears for MPs. It's an easy job. Now, there are some MPs that have a conscience and will exercise it and are ready to pay the price for it. I was, if, if I may say so, one of those myself, and I paid a high price. I've been in political exile for 16 years. And so uh, there are such people, but most MPs are not like that. Most MPs care only about one thing, which is to still be an MP after the upcoming election, whenever it is. And uh, that I know because I spent almost 30 years amongst them. So I'm a pretty good judge, I think, of the character of most MPs. And that character has progressively gotten worse and worse and worse. And it's my contention that the current House of Commons is the smallest in stature and in character uh, that I have ever known in my political lifetime. Now, my, my third point is this. It doesn't matter what you or anybody else thinks might possibly happen after we Brexit, because the people were promised, promised that there would be a referendum and that the government would implement the result. Moreover, one year after the referendum, just one year, both Labour and Conservatives pledged to 80% of the electorate who voted for those two parties that they respected the result of the referendum and that they would implement it. They have neither respected it nor have they implemented it. And whatever way you dice that up, Michael, that spells trouble. Over to you. George, you're making this so uh, black and white. It is, it's not... Uh, I, I disagree about an MP's job being easy. It's not as hard as some jobs but it, it still has its burden. Well, I've done it and um, you haven't, Michael, so I, 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 I'm in, a, yeah, I'm in, a quite, I'm in quite a good... Uh, yeah, you I know, disagree with you. You, you, the you know, a, ha a hard job is going down a coal mine or digging roads or, or, uh, or, uh, or uh, performing life-saving operations on patients that will die as a result. It's not a hard job, Mike. Not, not physically hard, no. But it, it's or mentally still when you've got when you you've got the responsibility. It's like driving a bus. You're in charge of all your passengers. You've got a responsibility. Driving the bus is quite simple. Michael, but most of them spend most of the evening people. in the bar in the nineteen bars. Trust me, uh, they're not to be compared with brain surgeons or bus drivers or coal miners. Anyway, go on to your substantive point. Um, right. Well, as I say, I I still think that. 
when you've won the battle, right? You've won the, the vote. You 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 surely want it to be um, executed in the least harmful way for the country. Uh, I, I just want my decision to be implemented. Yes, but but not at any cost. No, I, I, this is what there's I think. no there's no qualifications on it, Michael. There was it didn't say on the ballot paper. Uh, Vote remain or vote leave, but not at any cost. It didn't say that. But, it was vote but, leave or vote remain. And and I won, that, and I insist that it be George. implemented. No, if, no if, come on, you're being disingenuous again. Life is not that simple. Um, you know, the, these MPs are trying to work forward. Just because, this is the other thing, that because they're either in or out. No, a lot of MPs want to be out, but safely. But everybody, like people like yourself, will say, oh, because they're dithering, they actually want a secret um, agenda they want to keep in. But well, I'm, a, I'm perfectly of convinced of that, Michael. That's the Sorry? problem. I'm perfectly convinced that they, they deliberately sought to block Brexit. That, I'm absolutely convinced no, of that. There are some, oh, without doubt. I mean, you've obviously got the SNP... Uh, want to block it because you know oh, for yeah. reason, which is fair enough. So, Michael, um, can I ask you one last point because we're running out of time? Yes, yeah, you got. Uh, one, yeah. You said you were a lever. You, yes, I must say definitely. you don't sound like one, but if you say that, I believe yeah. you. Are oh, you still okay. a lever? I, I am a lever. Passionately want to leave, but I don't want it to be. I want it to be um, managed le leaving, okay. which is not easy because it's been part of the problem. Was Theresa May. Our very first exchange with the EU allowed them to set the agenda of putting the cart before the horse. Oh, totally. Uh, on, had, that, uh, on that, total... we're at one, Michael. I, I, this is entirely the wrong way to have approached these negotiations. I've got to cut you off because there's a lot of people trying to get on, but I've enjoyed our chat. Thanks for it. Jamie is in South Wales. Let's hear from him. Jamie, go ahead. Go, no, George, OK? Yes, good, thank you. Uh, right, um... My question really is about, well, it's not about Brexit, but I would like to um, find out who this particular Tory MP is, right? And just maybe send him a tweet, just sort of a his face in something, you know. Can you remember in Who's 2000? Who's that? Who? Uh, I, well, I don't know who he is. That's it. See, that's why I, I want to know who this guy is. He shouted out at Jeremy Corbyn in 2016 after he came back and spoke to some, some socialist parties in Europe, and just as he was going to go on to what he was saying, the fella said, they shouted out, who are you? And it really brought the house down and they heckled him because a lot of people didn't know who Jeremy Corbyn oh, is. I see, but yeah. There's been, yeah, there's been a massive, you know, he's probably one of the most famous politicians in the world now. And this is before the election as well. Yeah. And I was looking at the Tories, they were all jeering and laughing, Theresa May was at the front, they are all laughing. It's on RT, on YouTube, I'm looking at it all right. Yeah, I, I actually don't know and I don't remember it, but we've got a very intelligent audience and uh, I've no doubt that uh, before the, the night uh, is over, Jamie, we'll get an answer to that. So keep following me on Twitter and we'll Great. see see if we can identify Thanks. the miscreant. All I'd say, Jamie, is they're not laughing now because the reason they're terrified of an early election is because they're scared that he might win it. And he's the bookie's favourite to win it. Absolutely, and I hope he does. I hope it all happens. But if I can get a message to that Tory MP who shouted at Jeremy Corbyn, who are you? Well, my question is mirrored back at him because he smashed the Tories' majority. So that guy, whoever he was, is probably not even in the House of Commons anymore. Yeah. So my message to him is, who are you? Well, you've made that point very succinctly. Let's hear from Martin in Newington. Go ahead, Martin. Hello, George. Hello. Uh, I wish I could have spoken to um, uh, Prof Professor Curtis. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, there's so much to say on, on, on this subject. But one of the key things is, uh, what's his face? Mogg and also Johnson said, in, in fact, to quote Mogg, he said, this is the greatest vassalage since King John paid homage to Philip II. Yes, and then, he, and then he voted for it. Exactly. I mean, how could you? How could Not you sure how you recover from that one, to be honest. 
Exactly. Well, and I, I listened to him today, and he, he struggled to, to recover from it. Yeah. He, he was very uh, short, uh, uh, prickly with the people who, yeah. who were awesome. saying just what I'm saying now. And given uh, that it didn't even work, Martin, he must be feeling pretty sorry for himself in his, well, cas- in his castle. He's right <laughs> now in his double-breasted pyjamas, his double-breasted silk dressing gown, uh, and his double-breasted slippers. Uh, smoking a double-breasted pipe uh, with all six of his beautiful children, and I bet he's crying into his cocoa. But, George, it is astonishing that someone like him and Johnson would be willing to sacrifice our independence for their political careers. It's, It's outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. And I think it's, one more it's, thing It's not a said, surprise with Johnson, because uh, if you want my honest opinion, he'd sell his own mother uh, for, uh, for a temporary advantage. But it is a surprise well, I, with Mogg, because Mogg's whole shtick is that he's a highly principled fellow. Well, 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 well he, 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 he attempts to give that... Uh, impression, but I think, well, I hope that he he would have disabused most of the public by this flip flip flopping. And the other thing that must be said is that a lot of um, what the, the self righteous uh, people who 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 say things like the people who want folk leave are are Zionists. Well, it's the people who want to to, to restrict access. To, 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 to less developed places in the world. Yes, and yes. Cling to the people That's a point that is never are. made. It'll be well, made well, by yes. me over the next uh, six or eight weeks or so uh, at every occasion, but it's a point that's never made that and, actually and fortress now, it's Europe... A key, it's, a key, it's a key point. And fortress when I, when Europe is to... built to keep out the people exactly. and the goods and services Ex- from the poorest Ex- countries in the world. Precisely. And when I made that point to um, uh, Femi, he, he he threw up this idea of the EBA, which is the anything who but is this, arm. Who is this Femi uh, of whom you speak? No, it, uh, Femi, the, um, the leaves, the, the, the remain um, fellow, I'm sure that's his name, Fem, Fe, Femi something or the other. He was on, he was on with your colleague, uh, uh, um, Condren, Alex Condren, yes. is that his name? Yes. Yeah, so when I made the point to him, he threw up this idea of anything but arms treaty and then tried to force me to, 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 just to shift from what I wanted to say, which is that the EU works against the better interests of the poorer countries. And in, afterwards, I thought, well, bringing up the EBA actually strengthens my point because, number one, the, the, the European Union, you, 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 cannot, you cannot apply to be part of the EBA. You are, in a very paternalistic way, you are selected and you can be deselected. The poorer nations have no, no attempt to apply. It's out of their... Uh, control and interestingly, the EBA came into force in 2001, and uh, the letters are signed. The more recent letters to, to little modifications are signed by either Tusk or Juncker. And interestingly, the only country in the EBA, there are only 49 countries, uh, but the only one in the Caribbean. Just to give you an example, how useless it is. It's Haiti. In the whole Caribbean, just think of how many tiny little countries in the Caribbean. Haiti is the only one who is in it. And even before I was born, Haiti was poor. They're still dirt poor. And I I, I checked up some figures from 2016. Haiti's uh, balance of payments, it went from minus 356 in 2005 and in 2017, it's minus 723 billion. God help them. Martin, I'm appointing you an honorary professor at the Open University of the Airwaves. So any further calls that you make, you're Professor Martin of Newington now. Let's take a call from Thomas in Worthing. Thomas, go ahead. Good evening. 
Good evening. Mm. Um, the chap that your caller was just speaking about is a guy called Femi Alawal, who's the director. Of, I now know that. Uh, yeah, Arcoid. I've never. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I've. I give uh, these uh, FBPE people a pretty wide mm. berth myself, even in yeah. Waitrose. Go ahead, Thomas. It's- it's quite interesting, actually, because I'm a firm Brexiteer, and I just completely agree with the guy on Twitter, um, he, he, and which is actually, funny enough, the reason I'm calling. Okay. Um, Tommy Robinson gave that speech, and there was that whole gathering, UKIP gathering, that took place earlier. Did he speak on the that. UKIP platform or on his he own did. platform? He stood behind the UKIP banner on the platform. He was wow. invited by Gerard Batten wow. to speak. Yeah, and this is what I find terrifying. You know, you've got a a resurgent UKIP in the polls, um, who, and, and then you know a population who feel completely abandoned by the mainstream parties, who are going to be looking for an outlet for their Brexit supporting vote. And I say this as a Brexiteer, a, a member of the SDP. I find it quite terrifying where that vote could go. Yes, exactly. I but think- but I warned them over and over again that if you uh, frustrate the will of the poorest uh, people in the land, the most working class people in the land, you are creating a vacuum that the far right and the extreme nationalists will seek to fill. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And the extreme left, I might add. I mean, I, I think we have a very big problem in this country of political parties saying something and, and politicians in particular saying something just to get that £80,000 a year pay packet and then going completely against what they promised to do. And there's so many examples of this that, I mean, we need to be looking at a system in this country that has right to recall in it because there are so many, so many dishonest politicians. In yes, exactly. Right yeah. Now. I mean, someone but just you, brought up with me, uh, Thomas, that perhaps the Chartist demand for an annual uh, uh, election for Parliament should be brought up. Maybe uh, a staggered election, uh, but I think it would be better to keep what we have but have the absolute right of recall uh, so that uh, if X number of your constituents uh, recalled you, you'd have to fight again another by-election. That's the best way for the electorate to constantly uh, control their member of parliament. I mean, wouldn't it be lovely if we had a proper, a properly proportional representational system in this country? Indeed where it would. Had a real and, and maybe even a constitution, Thomas. <laughs> Amen to that. I mean, yeah, I just, I, like I said, I, I think right now, and I don't think politicians are probably taking this seriously, there is a very, very real risk that at the next um, general election you're going to find very extreme politicians that nobody on the moderate side of the Remain argument or the Leave argument are going to want to see taking the seats up in in Westminster. Well, I think they're going... They're, they're go- yeah. My guess is, uh, mm-hmm. it's risky to guess, but my, my guess is that in the European Parliament elections, the two yep. mainstream parties will suffer devastating losses. I, I think UKIP will probably regain their 20 MEPs that they, re, that they achieved in 2014. I don't think there's any doubt of and that. And then there's Farage. Um, yeah, and do you know what? I mean, Seth, as much as I disagree with a lot of what he said, he separated himself from Tommy Robinson and UKIP yeah, when, I, I, when the going he, got tough. He, he behaved in a principled manner on that. Yeah. Whatever else you think about other things that he's said and done, he said he could not be a part of UKIP, which was embracing uh, the kind of elements, uh, the hooligan uh, and worse elements mm-hmm. uh, that uh, Batten has uh, embraced. I was a UKIP member for nearly four years, and that's what broke the camels back in 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 my uh, my way of thinking. I just didn't want to be a part of the party. No, and people have it said was, to me, was, you know, you're standing in the European Parliament elections. Why don't you hook up with uh, UKIP and so on? I couldn't possibly uh, hook up with uh, with the likes of Robinson and any political party that was giving him uh, platforms and indeed honours. Yeah. I mean, what can, but what can we do? And again, you, you, I mean, going back to what you were just saying a second ago, who do people have to vote for that uh, are being honest? I mean, I, you know, I, I'm a bit spit on Jeremy Corbyn. I, you know, I admire some things that he says, and I completely disagree. With other well, things. won't the SDP be standing be in the European elections? 
I'd like to think that he had candidates that would be like-minded. But the problem I have with Jeremy Corbyn in this Brexit argument is I think everybody knows that he's a Brexiteer deep down, and yet he can't be open about that because of his parliamentary party. So, again, people don't have an honest vote to go for. OK, Thomas, uh, thanks for the call. Uh, extremely interesting. Uh, let's take a break. MP for Tamworth, as was, is the miscreant who shouted, Who are you? at Jeremy Corbyn back in 2016 or 2015. I can't uh, quite remember what the caller said, but I told you our clever listeners would be on it uh, like a terrier, and indeed they were, and lots of people have uh, um, mailed me, tweeted me, etc. with that information. Now, Archie on SMS says, Parliament is past its sell-by date. It's time to thin the herd. Lizzie says the Conservatives have paid an impersonator and published this fake post. We are all reporting it as fake news on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, well, that's from the legend, Lizzie. Uh, I can't see the image, uh, so uh, I can't really comment on it, Lizzie. But everyone who follows and everyone should uh follow uh, the legend that is Lizzie, L-I-Z-I-F-L-E, uh, on Twitter. You'll be able to see the image, which I can't. And Ryan says, Remainers may disagree with Dennis Skinner and Kate Hoy, but they only vote for true Brexit. Not even they voted for May's horrible brino today, while John Mann, Caroline Flint and three others did, only to undermine Corbyn. Skinner and Hoy equal real labour. And Fra says the people gave the government a mandate to negotiate a withdrawal from Europe. The EU 27 plus the UK agreed a Brexit strategy, but Parliament refused to endorse it. They don't want a no deal, but cannot agree a deal. What a farce. Time to go now. And uh, this one is from a very erudite man. I think we should make him an honorary professor Two, even though he never calls the show, he writes the very, very best. He says, During our speech today, May said that Parliament will not permit a no-deal Brexit. This is typically dishonest. In 2017, Parliament voted that Britain would leave the EU today with no deal the default position. This was and still is legally binding. May omits this to blame parliamentary obstinacy for betraying the Brexit she never wanted. The ever-decreasing margin in the vote for her deal suggests she and the EU are engaged in a war of attrition against British voters. Consequently, every time deadline day approaches, I suspect the EU will extend Article 50 until they get their deal through. But whatever happens, leavers and remainers will need to unite against corporatist forces to defend living standards. How clever is that? And Mark says, uh, Brexit will never happen. Parliament will stop it. We need another vote. And the communicipalist says, Theresa May is acting out EU strategy of constantly repeating votes until it gets its own way. Hardly surprising, though, since the so-called May deal is clearly an EU-created document, and they called that a negotiation. Let's hear from Tony in Ghoul. Welcome back, Tony. Hi, George. You all right? Yeah, good. Nice to hear from you. Yeah, yeah, George. I'm just going to put it in layman's terms. Um, I've asked you this before, and I'm going to ask you again. I'm going to pick your brains. A yes or no answer. On the basis that this uh, vote has been failed three times, could Theresa May technically forget all politics on all sides? Could she technically next week just say, stuff the lot of you, we're coming out with no deal? Yes, I she can, as uh, Samson... Right. As Professor Sampson just pointed out, that right. whatever she I, I, said today, that remains the legal position. Right. Well, I'm going to interrupt now, and I'm going to say something to everybody listening out there tonight, because I thought that was the case, and I'm glad you've confirmed that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you vote remain. It doesn't matter whether you vote leave. The fact is, Theresa May, right or wrong, has gone to Brussels. She's got a deal that the House of Commons can't agree on. If she ever wants to gain a tiny, tiny bit of respect in this country, she has to show some balls and some leadership, which she will not do, and just say to the country tomorrow, 
we're coming out on the basis that we've whether whether it's right or wrong is irrelevant. Seventeen point four million people have said let's come out. Commons can't agree with it. I am taking the leadership and I'm coming out. And for that reason that she hasn't, I will never vote for Conservative Pyre again. And as far as I'm concerned, I won't vote again. That's all I've got to say, George. All right, Tony. Uh, I, I just caution you not to... Uh, it's not my business who you vote for, but trust me, the political class would be happy if none of you voted. As long as half a dozen of them, uh, half a dozen of you voted, and you voted for them. So, trust me, you are not in any way frightening the political class by saying you'll never vote again. First of all, they don't believe you, but secondly, if you're telling the truth and you follow it through, nobody will be happier than them. They don't care about voters. They only care about getting enough votes for themselves to put them back into Parliament. So as I said earlier, if you vote for a donkey, don't expect it to do anything else in Parliament, but put its face in the nose bag and hee-haw else. If you don't want a donkey in Parliament, you need to look for a thoroughbred at every level. And if you can't find one, you need to put yourself up. Because, trust me, you'll be more of a thoroughbred than most of them. Notwithstanding the points that were made earlier, most MPs and most ministers nowadays are singularly the least impressive amongst us. We are ruled by the least amongst us. That's my belief. That's my take. Now, I'm particularly sorry tonight because a huge number of callers and texters and emailers and SMSers and tweeters have not gotten on to the show, and I'm very, very sorry about that. This is one of these nights when it would have been great if we could have run this show on. But the great Ian Lee, surreally brilliant, is up after me, and you need to stay tuned uh, for that. Now, I said right at the beginning that it's now no longer a question of Brexit or no Brexit. It's now a question of democracy. I have never believed that the Queen is sovereign, that Parliament is sovereign. For me, the people of Britain are sovereign, and it's their sovereignty I struggled in the referendum to win back, and it's their sovereignty that Parliament betrayed today. Talk Radio. Contact Talk Radio. Call 0344 499 1000.